one. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the 2017 Testing Within Government Showcase event. Um, I'm Dallas Stower, the Assistant Director General for Strategic ICT in the Department of Science, Information Technology and Innovation, herefore referred to as the city for brevity. Um, I'd like to start by firstly respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which this event is taking place and elders past, present and future. I would also like to acknowledge the Honourable Leanne Enoch, uh, MP, Minister for Innovation, Science and Digital Economy and Minister for Small Business. I'd also like to acknowledge the Director General for the City, Jamie Merrick, and the large contingent of senior executives across Queensland Government who all seem to be sitting in the same row down there. Uh, that wasn't planned. Um, so just some housekeeping before we get started. Um, so the usual things in terms of, of exits. So the exits I think are clearly marked. There are two exits to the back and to the side. So in the event that there is an evacuation, please follow the instructions of the QUT fire wardens um, who are trained um, to uh, evacuate this building and move away from the building when you get outside. They'll indicate where you need to assemble. Can I also ask for the respect of your colleagues beside you, can you ensure that your mobile phones are turned off to silent? Uh, those with MVP um, uh, phases, set them to stun, please. Um, can I also um, ask that any, for anyone who needs to exit during the session, if they could please use the exit at the rear, it will um, cause less distraction for people um, exiting from down the bottom. And for those of you that might need the toilets, I think you're familiar when you came in the front, the toilets were at the front entrance as you, as you came in. Uh, we are live streaming today and recording today's session, and so I welcome all of our industry and government viewers across the state and beyond uh, who might be viewing this today. So we have one of our colleagues who was part of the Twig process, who is sitting back and relaxing in the Greek islands, so hopefully Mark, you're watching this from the Greek islands, although we have no sympathy for you. Uh, okay, it's my great pleasure now to introduce um, the Minister, so to start proceedings, could you welcome the Honourable um, Leanne Enoch, Minister for um, Innovation, Science and Digital Economy and, and Minister for Small Business um, onto the stage. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Yes, stay away from me, Dallas. You don't sound very well at all. Apparently he's nearly got pneumonia. Yeah? Okay, take it easy. Uh, let me begin, of course, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather. And in doing so, may I acknowledge the more than 3,000 generations of Turrbal people, of Yagara people, who have maintained cultural practices on this country. And can I acknowledge all of our elders, from wherever you come from, whatever your culture, those that are past and those still with us, guiding us into the future. Uh, can I also lend my acknowledgements to the long list that Dallas just shared with all of us. Uh, I know that the Director General, Jamie Merrick, will be with us soon, and I also understand that um, Merrick Kowalkovich uh, will be joining us later this morning. But can I just take a moment to acknowledge everybody who has been involved in this round of TWIG and to congratulate you on the efforts that you've made. Uh, this is, an, this is a, a project that has become uh, a real, imp a very, very important one uh, because it's all about ensuring that we are prepared for the future and ensuring that we are giving uh, small businesses and startups the best chance possible to be able to compete with any other business in this state. And the Queensland Government, of course, and governments more broadly, have a role to play in all of that. Uh, so uh, for me, TWIG is one of those projects where I can see uh, great potential, not just for the businesses involved and for the agencies involved, but also for our state into the future. Uh, because this government has a very strong vision to improve the lives of Queenslanders. We want to secure the biggest benefits for our people and our state. To do that, we need to harness all the benefits digital can offer us. One of the key drivers behind our $420 million whole of government advanced Queensland initiative is to foster stronger working relationships between government and our talented tech startups and SMEs. We know the ICT sector is transforming our economy and underpinning the knowledge, uh, and underpinning the knowledge jobs uh, that we are seeing uh, emerging and on the horizon. That's why we see this collaboration between government and business as the best way to create innovative new ICT products that deliver high quality, real world outcomes. 
So again, I want to congratulate uh, the Testing Within Government participants who are showcasing their solutions and know-how here this morning. And I got to meet uh, all of the teams before we came in. And my apologies, that's why we're late. Uh, because anyone who's met me knows that uh, I, it's not just a quick hello. It's a, I want to know what's going on. And uh, I've got many questions to ask. So, And I'm very, very interested and passionate about what everyone's doing. But of course, these results are the culmination of the second round of TWIG, which was launched in March this year. After the first round, back in August 2016, generated so much interest that we, of course, decided to repeat the program. Being part of TWIG offers startups and SMEs the chance to develop their knowledge, skills and experience. It also gives these businesses access to broader commercial opportunities, both domestically and overseas. Many of the solutions you'll hear about this morning can be potentially applied in ways probably not even anticipated by the participants themselves. It's this unknown quality that creates such a buzz around TWIG um, at a business and, of course, at a government level. We're very proud to take the lead when it comes to proactively working with talented startups and small business operators to, uh, to find innovative solutions to specific business problems. And by supporting homegrown innovators, we know we're helping business prove great ideas, which adds to their commercial viability. Last year, I said the Testing Within Government program was a learning and development experience. Well, our government has learnt and we are continuing to learn more. I also said we had to become more agile and innovative when solving problems and become, better, uh, become a better customer for SMEs. In fact, I think last year I was very vocal about if we could tip over the procurement issue uh, in state government, then we could unlock massive potential for startups and SMEs across this state. And many of you will have heard about the Buy Queensland procurement strategy or policy that uh, the Palaszczuk government launched recently, which is the culmination of those efforts of really trying to tip it over and do things differently. Uh, so uh, you will see those, uh, the outcomes from that kind of policy emerging over the months and years ahead of us. But TWIG is part of that. Uh, I'd also... Um, uh, uh, I also uh, mention all of that because uh, our job as government uh, is to make government collaboration easier and more productive. The real world solutions on show this morning demonstrate that the Palaszczuk government has a plan for improving and modernising government services. Not only are we developing innovative digital solutions, but more importantly, we have established a pathway uh, for others to follow and grow. So I want to thank everybody who's been engaged in round two of TWIG. Um, I know we've I've just seen some remarkable things before coming in here. Uh, and as we see them showcased this morning, I know everybody in this auditorium is going to feel the same way about, uh, about these great ideas as I do. And that is that we have got a very bright and fruitful future ahead of us. And the government and SMEs uh, and startups can work together in this fashion uh, even more so into the future, then nothing can stop us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you for, uh, we're extremely grateful for your time here this morning and sharing those kind words with us. Thank you. Um, as the Minister mentioned, this is the second uh, TWIG round. The aim of um, the Events Queensland TWIG program is to encourage small to medium enterprises. Uh, to improve the positioning of their products by working collaboratively with the Queensland Government on real business uh, problems. Successful applicants receive funding to test and refine their products through the, this unique 12-week program. The TWIG program is designed to accelerate the growth and capability of small businesses and start-ups in Queensland, provide valuable experience to SMEs in how to deliver products to large enterprises, which Government obviously is one of those, encourage government to become more agile and innovative in problem solving itself. So following the success of the initial round of TWIG that we conducted last year, the second round was, uh, was launched in March of this year. In this round uh, of TWIG, um, we had eight government agencies collaborating on 11 problems. And we've also run um, commercialisation and uh, procurement workshops to first assist SMEs taking part in the program. From a total of uh, some 80 um, applications, 11 applicants were selected to 
participate in this round of tweak. They've been working with government agencies on uh, problem, uh, with problem, government agency problem experts uh, through this unique 12-week program, using an agile approach to defining and delivering solutions to those problems. We've also been very fortunate to have um, two um, external third-party experts. So we, we doubled it up from the round one. We've now got two experts, um, Peter Laurie, who's just joined us on stage, and we'll hear more from Tom Murphy, who's in the audience later on. So Peter joins us with more than 20 years' experience in the software industry and runs Junta, a boutique software and innovation consulting firm. He's also the mentor in residence at River City Labs, as I'm sure most people will be familiar with uh, River City Labs. He's mission leader for a startup catalyst and does many other things in the startup ecosystem. So I think you could probably agree that that Peter comes well qualified to provide advice both to uh, startups and in also, for that matter, for government. Uh, Tom is a business owner with uh, specialised knowledge and experience in the, de in the digital and technology space. He's currently a digital and a data strategist at Roland and previously held executive positions at game developer Halfbrick, which you guys would be familiar were famous for developing the Fruit Ninja game. So again, Tom comes to us with a great wealth of experience uh, that he's that both the gentlemen have been able to pass on to the, to the SMEs. They've been a valuable resource to the TWIG program, uh, and as I said, they've all also helped um, government um, and industry sort of push the boundaries, and, um, and we'll see soon some of these great solutions. Um, today we'll hear from the uh, SMEs and business program, program ex problem experts who took part in this year's pr um, problem. So just to set the scene in terms of the agenda for today, there uh, four panels that we'll be running through. The first panel, gratefully, is, uh, has got on stage while I've been talking. That's great. That's, uh, we'll pick up some time. We're running slightly late. Um, we'll hear from the, uh, the panels, um, and uh, then there'll be an opportunity at the end of those presentations from the panel members for questions. So, to make my life easier, can you think about the questions as they're running through their presentations? So, that means I don't have to ask Dorothy Dixes at the end. And don't be shy. Start thinking about those questions now. Um, you can also show your support with using the technology out there um, spread the word using the hashtag AQTTwig on Twitter. Um, watch for Twitter handles for each of the SMEs as they present and I'm sure they'll appreciate your support through social media. So, excuse me. So, to, um, to get things started, so let's hear from the first panel for our 2017 Twig participants. So we have on stage at, the, uh, at my right, your left, uh, Peter Laurie and his first group. Uh, we have Incitus and the Queensland Police Service who worked on the vision sourcing problem, an interactive map of CCTV locations to help improve public safety. After that, we'll hear from Enturo and the Department of Environment and Heritage Protection who have been collaborating to ensure mobile access to biodiversity data to inform planning and development decisions. And finally, we'll have here from Ditto Labs and Sightsee who have been working with, uh, with the city um, to use 3D capture technology to display 3D virtual models of iconic Queensland buildings online, the likes of the Cultural Centre across the river. So with that, I'll hand across to the panel. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Bill Barrett. I'm the Chief Superintendent of the Organisational Capability Command in the Queensland Police Service. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation on the QPS Vision Sourcing Challenge, undertaken in collaboration with Insitus and made possible through the TWIG program. The problem we presented to the marketplace was to create a practical software solution to improve our capability to harness remote access to CCTV and other sources of vision. Access of the vision we wanted to come from the community, government agencies and the private sector, from both fixed cameras and mobile devices. Access to streaming and post-event stored vision made accessible through a common software solution will benefit the QPS in the management of major events such as the Commonwealth Games, command and control of critical incidents, the emergency management response at times of natural disaster, and to aid in the investigation of crimes, all to make our community safer. I hope you enjoy our presentation. Thank you. Okay, good morning. I'm Karina Maurer from Incitus. I'm here with Inspector Alison Jewell and Inspector Rebecca Martin and we're going to give you a look into what we've done over the last 12 weeks. So Insitus is a leading provider of telecoms productivity and cross-industry process automation solutions. When we saw the TWIG problem statement, we knew that one of our applications that we already had 
and our experience with video streaming could assist with a solution. So Twig has allowed us to develop our product further to meet the needs that we may not have otherwise looked at. And this application can help businesses to map and monitor a wide variety of information. It doesn't just have to be CCTV cameras. Firstly today, we'd like to show you a presentation that provides an overview of our solution. Do you spend hours, days and weeks door knocking to locate and collect CCTV footage? To piece together events after an incident has occurred? Would your job be much easier if you had a map that showed you where registered CCTV cameras were? Insitus iView allows you to map CCTV locations, include helpful camera details and connect cameras for live streaming and recorded footage. We all need flexibility. Insitus iView can either act as your sole video management system or it can easily integrate with your existing solution to enhance your current capability. Your vision sourcing possibilities are endless. Connect your government sourced camera information and video streams with businesses big and small, household property cameras, public mobile video of ad hoc emergency events, and via our UAV technology for automated monitoring or ad hoc requirements. You can search for cameras on a specific route or in a designated area using the drawing tools, then create, save and share specific incidents. Easily piece together historical events via a 3D view where fixed cameras and members of the public have sent live streams covering emergencies. With online and offline maps, users in the field will have a wealth of data at their fingertips. Contact us now at sales at insitus.com.au. Thanks Karina and Insitus, the team's just up the back there. Uh, from a policing perspective, we were looking at how best to, answer, to ask Queenslanders to register their CCTV cameras so we can continue to work with the community to fight crime. Although we see this software solution has potential use in many different community safety applications, we have put together the following video as a practical example of its potential use. Please keep in mind that all the um, information that you see in these videos is based on dummy data and if the system was to go to production that we would be accessing via permission only. So what you've seen in this scenario has captured the capabilities to deliver immediate results to frontline officers. Instead of having to knock on the doors to find locations of CCTV cameras and then physically go back and collect the footage, the, vision and the map and vision can be at the officer's fingertips. There's also the ability to request and remotely collect historical footage from a desktop via the web-based interface for officers inve investigating community safety offences which have occurred previously. I'm now going to pass over to Karina for um, another example of a very cool aspect of the app. Okay, so our mobile application includes some augmented reality that can help locate nearby cameras. 
So the officer clicks on an AR button and they can hold up their device, they view their surroundings and the cameras will be displayed on their screen. So in the top right hand corner you can select the distance you want to search. In the top left the camera locations are shown on a map so you can see nearby cameras and down the bottom it comes up with the camera name and the distance away. So that camera for instance is probably about where that pole is. Thanks, Karina. So just in wrapping up, Winston Churchill said, success is not final, fail failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. Together we learn that by working in a collaborative, agile and flexible manner, we could produce a solution which could not have been developed to its current state had we been working in silos. By supporting each other and building trust, any obstacles along the way were easily overcome or agreement was reached that we couldn't actually meet that capability in the time allowed. We recommend the TWIG program for other depart government departments and business, as the experience has given us, uh, at both our organisations, a better understanding of the opportunities and the barriers in developing and implementing a business solution in government. The QPS vision is to deliver safe and secure communities through innovation, collaboration, and best practice. We feel our partnership with the TWIG program and Incitus has in part helped us move towards that vision. The product also we consider has wider application across government, local councils, private industry, so Incitus will be available outside for any questions. Um, and we would like to thank the Incitus team, Peter and um, DeCity, for their assistance along the way. And we just have a small token in which they may remember us by. So that's the conclusion of our presentation. Thank you. My name is Nick Weymouth and I'm Acting Deputy Director General, Conservation and Sustainability Services in the Department of Environment and Heritage Protection, Queensland. Mm -hmm. Queensland is Australia's most naturally diverse state. Its biodiversity values are recognised under both state and national legislation and via international conventions. This recognition is evidence-based, supported by high-quality information on the state's species and ecosystems. While Queensland retains high levels of biodiversity, it's also experiencing biodiversity loss at unprecedented levels. Among efforts to address this loss are stronger laws to protect areas of conservation significance and mobilisation of resources to restore habitat. Information and education are, of course, also critical to improving Queensland's natural environment. It's important that community members have access to better biodiversity information, not just people that have the specialised skills or, or knowledge to understand it. For example, Landcare and other conservation organisations can benefit from easy access to biodiversity information to help plan projects. Similarly, land developers will also benefit from easier access to information on environmental development. Sustainable development is possible, but it requires solutions that recognise and protect those important values. Easier access to information is possible through the use of a smart device which can quickly locate a particular area of interest. These devices are also capable of performing a search on a property that will return information on biodiversity from a range of databases, as well as information on policies that protect those values. Our challenge was to develop a mobile app that will expand and improve community access to and use of, use of information on Queensland species and ecosystems. Hi, I'm Hugh. I'm one of the directors of Maturo. I'd like to welcome Sean and Aaron from the Department of Environment and Heritage Protection. Today we're excited to showcase our solution for testing within government uh, planning for nature. Um, as you just heard, Queensland is committed to sustainable development. Currently there are several sources uh, of data to help farmers, developers and industry plan for their de developments. Working closely with the department, we were able to bring all the available data into one easy to use mobile app and website portal. Crosschecker is a product that our team have been developing over the last two years that simplifies the complexity surrounding legislative risk and compliance. While improving access to government information, we are able to take line of business data, cross reference with policies legislations, allowing subject matter aspects to produce consistent outcomes. Over the last 12 weeks, we've built a REST API on top of our core Crosschecker product uh, to communicate with an iOS, uh, iOS app that we built um, and 
uh, using ArcGIS uh, to be able to talk to numerous data sets within government space, query specific information relating to spatial points. We'd now like to show you a quick demonstration of our app in progress. Ryan here works for a developer who is looking to develop a land for a new residential apartment complex. Ryan has found a block of land that he, that he wants to develop uh, for sale. However, he needs to know the site is, is impacted by any environmental uh, constraints. Ryan's first move is to play it safe. He uses Crosstricker, Planning for Nature, to conduct an environmental assessment within the space of a few clicks. Ryan selects his area of interest, gives it a, a project a name to save for the inquiry for future use. Crosstricker's data engine then cross-references all the legislation, regulations and conditions relevant to the worksite, all in one place at the click of a button. All the environmental risk and impacts of this project are managed. Crosstracker takes it a step further, giving you access to compliance information regarding the area, as well as links to government biodiversity data, showing you all the flora and fauna in relation to the site, along with descriptions and pictures. You also are able to visualise the area selected uh, in the app as well. When Ryan returns to his office, he can then use this, uh, access the save project within Crosschecker web portal and continue his work. Ryan and his team can, can work with confidence when purchasing and, and building this land within the law without the worry of costly compliance breaches. It's Crosschecker compliance uncomplicated. So let's hand over to Sean. Thank you. Um, this project. Uh, has really reinforced the benefits of um, taking a more proactive approach to the way the department communicates biodiversity information to business audiences. And if we do want SMEs to use the data as a resource, um, the department must look at new ways to communicate its potential. Uh, I'm glad we've been able to do that um, through the TWIG program. Learnings from the project highlighted the need uh, for departments to continue their efforts to make species and ecosystems data easier to find and consume. The project also identified the need for finer grained information about potential users of biodiversity data and information. That points to the benefits of investing in audience research and developing marketing tools. Armed with such a resource, uh, the department could present a more comprehensive package of information to SMEs, one that gives critical insights into the potential users of new products. On a personal level, I've had an opportunity to use Agile project techniques for the first time, and they were easy to use uh, on the job and certainly valuable to have in my project management toolkit. Uh, I should also mention I've been on a, a steep curve to learn what goes into developing a mobile app and how much effort is needed to achieve a usable product in such a short space of time. In conclusion, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the TWIG team and the staff at Insuro uh, for their support and wish them well in future. Thanks, Ra. Um, I just want to quickly touch on our lessons learned as well. Um, over the last 12 weeks, we have faced some hurdles. Uh, accessing the data we needed to, to complete the work was a bit of a challenge. Some roadblocks were in place, uh, allowing us to get access to internal data externally. Um, having access to this data and the data custodians at the start of the project might have made it for a smoother, a smoother project. Um, also being able to use that data meaningfully uh, was a challenge. We had to spend some time to rebuild those data sets so that our, our app and can consume it. Um, so we think that having that data easily accessible in a web service would have been, would have been a great, great help. Uh, lastly, the Agile framework is great. Um, and, and Sean it did uh, take it very well, but we feel that the government may take some time to adopt this. Uh, I'd like to hand over to uh, Ryan, who's one of our lead developers, and he'll talk you through the, um, some future enhancements we'd like to make. Looking forward into the future potential for the application, we see many exciting possibilities in terms of enhancing the user's experience and enriching the value of the data. The enhancements we are focusing on include offline capabilities, providing users with the access to the data without internet connectivity, satellite imagery, and augmented reality surrounding the species data. On behalf of all of us at Ventura, we would like to thank you for the opportunity to present today and invite you to come and see us at our booth to talk more about Crosschecker and how you can play it safe. Hi, my name's Andrew Spina. I'm the Assistant Director General for Digital Productivity and Services in the Department of Science, IT and Innovation. I want to talk to you today about a unique problem within Queensland State Archives, 
I'm standing here in front of a number of these exquisitely designed models that are available only if you've got the ability and the patience to wait a couple of weeks to make an appointment to come and see them within Queensland State Archives at Roncorn. There are almost 50 of these models that are in place and the problem is we actually want to make them accessible to everyone within Queensland. How do we do that and maintain the integrity of the models and ensure that we don't damage them? That's the problem that we want to actually resolve. All right, good morning everyone. My name is Christy Tamas. I'm from Ditto Labs. I'm here today with Lachlan Crane from Sightsee and Liz Radford from Queensland State Archives. Um, Ditto Labs is a 3D scanning bureau here in South East Queensland. Um, we use RTEC 3D scanners and photogrammetry to create digital models of real world objects and people. Um, by offering 3D scanning as a service, we enable our clients to fast track the manufacturing process or to create a digital showcase of their work. We've worked on everything from the aerodynamics of racing cars to 3D printed portraits to custom jewellery. We've scanned um, artist maquettes and now architectural models. Um, in order to deliver the best possible solution for this problem, we've collaborated with Sightsee. Uh, Ditto Labs captured the models and Sightsee's provided the online viewer. Uh, in this way, we hit that um, sweet spot between accuracy, accessibility, and also the beauty of the models. Um, I'd like to introduce Lachlan to tell you a bit more about Sightsee. Uh, so Sightsee specialises in the digitisation and the analysis of critical infrastructure. Uh, built here in Brisbane, our powerful 3D viewer is one of only three that exist in the world today enabling large files to be uh, inspected over an internet connection with incremental loading. Uh, infrastructure digitization and the analysis is allowing our clients to make more informed decisions and to reduce the, their operational costs. Thanks. All right, without further ado, I'd like to show you what we've produced in the 12 weeks of the program. Ditto Labs, in collaboration with Sightsee, has brought together industry-leading 3D scanning technology and Sightsee's powerful 3D viewing platform to give the public access to rarely seen physical objects. We developed a 3D capture and processing pipeline specifically for Queensland State Archives, a process which is consistent with their preservation imperative and a platform which delivers on their mandate to make the models publicly accessible. Everyone now has access to these models right in their hands, in their classrooms and in their homes. Users can fly over the models, can spin the models, can measure them and can follow the links to explore other information in the archives. Visit our website for more information and view the models for yourself. Alright, now you're not normally encouraged to pull your mobile phones out, but if you're so inclined, you can visit the web address there and you can pull the models up for yourself. Um, or it's the perfect cover to check Twitter. Um, we do know of a few iOS bugs, um, but just hit refresh or send us a DM so that we can fix it. Um, but now you're familiar with the structure of the Twig program, um, so I'd like to take you through some of the key lessons that we've learned through this process. The standout for me is the benefit of an iterative process. We were able to deliver a more appropriate solution once we understood the intention of the project and the complexity of the models. Um, the collaboration with QSA allowed us to deliver a better solution than if we'd tackled this problem through a regular commercial engagement. Now, how's that possible? Um, over the course of the program, we identified that there were two distinct purposes for the 3D capture. The first was public access, and the second was a 3D digital preservation. We were able to satisfy both of these objectives in the end, but at the start of the program, we wouldn't have been able to describe exactly what that would look like. QSA knew what they were after, but just not how to describe it. We now have a well-defined process to streamline the capture of the rest of the collection, um, and here's a quick snapshot of the process that we went through to do that.
Right. The TWIG program gave us time to work through a number of iterations which allowed us to come up with solutions to a range of the technical challenges. Our first priority was the care for the models. Many of these models are decades old and quite delicate. This meant we had to adjust our 3D capture techniques and employ more intensive post-processing than we'd initially planned. The tricky areas included the see-through perspex, the reflective surfaces, the fine details and the difficult to access sections of the models. Another challenge was the sheer size of the models and the level of detail that we wanted to achieve. In order to produce a model which can be easily seen in a browser, we had to be very specific about our processing, about our workflow and about our capture methods. Um, the team at Sightsee worked hard through the program to make sure that users have the best possible experience. Um, so I'm thankful to them for that. Um, I'd like to introduce Liz to talk about the value to Queensland State Archives. Oops, sorry. Um, so from a QSA perspective, the key outcome for us has been actually getting the models off the shelves and into people's hands. People can now access them through virtually any type of device, even in low bandwidth areas. The viewer is able to drive their own discovery and in a, a way that is completely new, engaging and exciting, and arguably even better than the original. But as a conservator, I didn't say that. <laughs> Importantly for QSA, no model was harmed in the process of capturing the experience. <laughs> and in fact, we, we were able to get to know them a little bit better as some of their secrets were revealed. In positioning QSA going forward, the masses of quality data that we now have available can be reused uh, for future technology applications and developments. We're now much more confident being able to speak the right language with the suppliers and ensure that the product is actually something that our customers want and will use. We've been able to explore market options for something that really wasn't available off the shelf and in the process we've had a bit of a virtual reality check as to what just is and isn't possible at the moment. Right. I'd like to thank the team at TWIG for their support and the energy they've put into making sure that we produced a good outcome for State Archives. Um, I'd like to thank Liz and the team at Queensland State Archives for embracing the project and allowing me to come and spend time in the archives. Um, in closing, we're proud of the results that we've delivered and we have a clear path to produce further improvements on what's already produced. Um, the engagement with Queensland Government has been a positive experience for me and for Sightsee and I'd encourage you to participate in future programs. Now, everyone pull out your phones and check out the models and come and talk to us afterwards as well. Thanks. How great were those presentations and the, the product demonstrations from our uh, first panel? Fantastic. So, um, give them another round of applause. Great. <laughs> And, uh, and how cute were those puppies? Uh, I know my Twig team desperately wanted the puppies here on stage, but I think that might have been a bit hard to handle. Um, so now's the time uh, for audience participation. Um, so we do have a roving microphone, which is wandering around the theatre here on both sides. So if you have any specific questions, um, uh, please put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you for those questions. So don't be shy. Don't make me ask Dorothy Dixon. Must be some questions somewhere, please. Up the back. Hi, just to make you walk the distance. Um, in relation to the, uh, the cross-checker platform, uh, I understand that there are um, issues with the sensitivity of biodiversity data as well, that there are certain things that um, uh, you don't want public access to, that people might want to um, uh, utilise that data to find uh, protected species, uh, you know, smuggle them off overseas. How do, how do you address that? Um, so the protected species um, data was a challenge for us. Um, obviously, you know, we're not allowed to just disclose that information, um, as you said. So. Um, what we've done is we've taken out any of the, you know, 
really endangered species and uh, what are the, confidential? Yeah, confidential species. We've taken those out of the data sets. Um, and yeah, that's the, the way around it really. Because um, it is a community facing portal, so anyone can access it. We're only consuming the data that we're given. So from the state government's point of view, if they give us the, the data, that's the data they're appropriate for us to, to, sh to show to the public. Um, hello, just for the 3D modeling uh, problem. I'm just wondering whether uh, anyone could just give a very brief example on how that agile process went over the, uh, the, the 12 weeks. I think the comment was made that the guys knew what they wanted, but they couldn't really describe that. I mean, is there a way of just quickly summarising how the 12 weeks went? Please? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, initially we pitched with a particular solution using RTEC handheld scanners, which are quite good for producing um, highly accurate um, measurement models. Um, so, that's what we walked in with. Queensland State Archives wanted 3D models, um, but didn't have the language to describe exactly how they wanted that to, to look. Um, through the course of the, 12, of the 12 weeks, over the six sprints, um, we narrowed it down and said, okay, look, what we're really looking at is a public access model, and for public access, we wanted to make it fast to download, easy to see, um, a nice, beautiful visual experience. Uh, and so that's what we focused on and we changed our methods and our capture methods to be more heavily weighted towards the photogrammetry than the uh, sole 3D scanning. So that's where we ended up. We ended up with a more photogrammetry generated model than the 3D scanning uh, because it was more appropriate to the public access. And so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, so just to follow up on that, um, so what Christy actually did is they took a really quick first shot at it and then they found out that that was good, but we could probably do a bit better, and then did a bit higher, and worked out that that probably take a little bit too long, but we get good results from it. So we understood how long that'd take, and then dialed it back a bit, and then found out the right sweet spot in which to operate. So it wasn't about sitting in a corner and trying to come up with a perfect solution. It was a, well, let's just give it a go and see if it's good enough. And if it's not, we'll improve. If it's not, if it's too good, then we'll dial it back a bit. So that, um, one of the nice things that came out of just general conversation with this team was, they said that they, there's absolutely no way that they could have gone to market and asked for this. And also, there was no way that they could have bid to do this work. So they've, they've got to a spot with this solution that was basically unachievable through traditional engagement methods. And that, that made me happy. OK, thank you. Unfortunately, um, uh, we've run out of time. And I know there was one question there, but can I encourage you maybe to uh, just go to the booze at the um, end of the session and, and, and chat to the teams there. So, and again, thank you, panel one. So, panel one can uh, now basically <laughs> exit the stage. And as um, that is occurring, I'll introduce panel two um, as they cross over. So, for panel two, we have uh, ProRoute and the Department of Transport and Main Roads, who have been focusing on a heavy vehicle rest area app to improve safety and provide information to drivers. Uh, following ProRoute, we'll have risk and insights in the Department of Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning, who have been collaborating on an online tool to automate risk assessment reports from large data sets. So there's a strong data theme coming through on lots of these um, problems. And finally, for panel two, we'll have Gay Resources in the Department of Science, Information Technology and Innovation, who have been working on an innovative way to explore the state's archival records as well. So if you can welcome all of the members onto the stage and I might ask um, the first group to come up. Thank you. Hello, I'm Anne-Marie Knox. I'm the Executive Director, Safer Roads Infrastructure for the Department of Transport and Main Roads. Heavy freight vehicles play a critical role in Queensland's transport network and driver fatigue is recognised as a significant road safety risk. In 2015, there were 53 heavy vehicle crashes relating to fatigue and in 2016, there were 44 fatigue-related crashes involving heavy freight vehicles. With these statistics in mind, in 2016, the Department of Transport and Main Roads conducted an audit of heavy vehicle rest areas throughout the state. The audit captured data about the rest areas, including their accessibility, 
a facility such as toilets and showers, Wi-Fi access and general site conditions. As this information was initially only available to our staff, the department saw an opportunity and entered into the Testing Within Government program. The program allowed us to examine innovative technology-based solutions to make the rest area data available to all road users while testing the application. Heavy freight vehicle drivers having mobile access to rest area information will support a safer road user culture by management of driver fatigue and should deliver tangible road safety benefits across Queensland. Thank you. Great. Hi everyone. My name is Peter Kolesnik. I'm Director of Road Safety the Department of um, Transport and, and Main Roads and alongside me here is um, Darren Brogan who's CEO of, the, of ProRoute, that's the company that we engaged with um, to enable um, this app to be developed to get the information out there to um, primarily the heavy vehicle um, users on our network. So uh, as Anne-Marie mentioned in the opening video, uh, last year we did an audit of um, just under 3,000 rest areas across the state and for us it was really important to, um, in, in order to try and further reduce the incidence of road trauma, to get a product out there as part of our customer experience uh, package that we have within Transport and Main Roads uh, to enable people to have good access to this information and see, you know, plan their journeys and look at places where they can pull over and have a good rest um, to break their, their travel. Um, so some, some of the key learnings, I suppose, that we got out of the um, the app's development was that it was really important to engage on site with industry. Darren will uh, step you through some really good feedback that we had on uh, regarding the product during its development phase. And in, we will um, plan to undertake a, an audit um, of the um, facilities of the network every couple of years, update our data sets and get this information out, of the, out to the community to help uh, facilitate reductions in road fatigue related road trauma. But I will now hand over to to Darren to talk about the product. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Peter. Hi, folks. I'm the CEO of ProRoute, and we're here to make logistics better. So what do we... We are a next-generation logistics platform. We're scalable, configurable, visibility, auditing is key things for us. We are very much a platform. We're currently in the delivery sector, bringing tools to transport, as well as smart cities, including underutilized assets and field workers. How do we do that? We do that with a cloud-based system uh, that allows easy deployment and scale. Um, the workers use mobile phone applications as well as alerts through browsers and mobile browsers to individuals so we can alert. Uh, as well as the worker, we can also uh, alert the people who are also affected. So let's talk rest spaces. Why are we here? Because we believe safer is better. And this is our product that we were able to do in the time frame. So through the, uh, the survey, we were able to get about 2,000 of these rest areas that were uh, applicable for the heavy vehicle regulator, or sorry, for the heavy vehicle um, audience. We were able to bring those in, have a look at what was the most important thing to the truck drivers and make sure we were servicing that information right up to them at their fingertips so they could get in, get value and get out. Um, we looked at the ETS, which is built on top of some of our existing technology to make sure that they were able to get to those rest areas within their allotted time as part of their fatigue management. They can only go a certain distance, so they need to know how long it will be, not necessarily how far. We also have second level value around check-ins and trying to do live updates for bay numbers, for example, um, as well as being able to make it easy for people to come back and check over and over. But we didn't just stop with the rest area, with reviews and community. We actually started to also look at rest area owners, being people who manage these rest areas, and how can we deliver value there too. So we have it integrated a incident reporting, which allows them to capture events by the crowd and deliver that directly into the appropriate team. So that was the product. So we actually got that product done in eight weeks. Uh, it's based on top of existing technologies. We're generally towards the enterprise, but this was focused towards the truck driver. And that's quite a lot in such a short period of time. I want to call out the user engagement because we think this is one of the critical parts to the success of our program. We went out to Dara to some of the inspection sites. We went to the TMR Customer Experience Lab. You can see some of the pictures of the building. The TMR Customer Experience Lab on George Street is absolutely awesome, but truck drivers and the CBD is just not going to happen, folks, so I wouldn't recommend doing that again. 
Um, so we went digital because a lot of them weren't going to come in. So Facebook was actually really useful for us. We did surveys, we did sponsored posts, we joined groups and started to engage with truck drivers when they had the time to do so. The joining the groups and the conversation with individuals was quite useful. Some of them didn't want to do a survey, but they were happy to have a conversation on Messenger or have a conversation on those. And a lot of that happened to be on Saturdays, folks, so just letting you know. Uh, we actually did do a survey, uh, and we did get some people who were happy for us to use some of their imagery, et cetera, and they were very interested as an as a industry um, of improved safety and improved knowledge. $50 gift charge, a gift card also did help the engagement quite a lot. Pre and post, the numbers went up quite significantly. And those user insights from those surveys made us be able to determine what was most valuable to the people that were going to use it, as we're not necessarily the primary users, because I have not driven a truck in a very long time, ever. But we didn't just, we didn't just integrate, we didn't just deal with truck drivers. We also went and saw the Heavy Vehicle Safety Working Group. If you're in the room, thank you very much. Um, they had lots of great feedback. They had risks, they had um, value propositions. That was across industry, including Shell, unions, uh, police services. I would say engage often and regular um, with all stakeholders, not just necessarily users. We didn't stop there. We also went out to Follomount. We went out to Dickinson's Transport and Lindsay. So thank you very much for your time. And this is some of their feedback. This is an actual truck driver. What do you think of the app? I think the app definitely has merit. Uh -huh. uh, it certainly might make it easier for drivers to know what amenities were at different stops if they're not familiar with that particular stretch of road. Yeah. Um, think it's a worthy endeavour? Well, absolutely, yeah. So, sorry about the audio, but it was on a truck yard and there's lots of trucks driving around. But the, the last bit, I don't know if you heard very well, that when I asked, was this valuable? He said, absolutely. Um, and that's great feedback. We can't actually ask for better than that. So let's dig into some of the feedback that we received. So the, initially, there was a reluctance of, uh, there was an initial reluctance in the program. There was the idea of a fear of punishment that they'd be actively tracked and if they missed and, and they went over that we'd punish them in some way. Now, we're not actively tracking those people. That's what we do in our enterprise product, not for this. Um, and the fact that it was a non-TMR application was seen as a positive and actually reduced some of their concerns. It was also seen as valuable by all drivers, but most of them saw it as an occasional use service because they generally know the area that they're in, but every single person was able to say at a time where they are in an area that they didn't know and they would actually find this useful. It was definitive that it would help in that fatigue management, especially with the timed ETAs, and every driver we spoke to said that they would use it, so that is a great news. Uh, and the transporting companies, they also said that they would put that through as part of their safety and use that as part of their set of tools. So let's go behind the scenes. We actually did a full product process um, in this short period of time with uh, customer discovery interviews, value exploration, data analysis, Wi-Fi, lo-fi, branding, because this is actually a separate product to what we generally do. Um, so here's a very quick example that you can see that we've actually went through a quite an in-depth process. We tested these mocks with truck drivers and individuals, as well as going through a full branding process of understanding what worked well and trying to keep in that safety brand, but then still be seen separately as our core product, because our core product is active tracking. We also did heavily inside the agile process, which I think worked quite well for us. So our lessons is agile work. We were able to raise issues and deal with those issues, design matters, and gold stars rock. So I'm Darren Rogan, um, our app is the Respace app, and I'm from ProRite. I'd love you to come check out the booth and see what we do. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Cathy Parton. I'm from the Department of Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. The Department's Local Government and Regional Services Division plays an important role in supporting local governments through policy development, good practice advice, capacity building initiatives and our grants funding programs. Currently, the Division doesn't have one system to collect, ingest or analyse the vital business intelligence and ensure it can be accessed throughout the Department. The Department's mix of different software platforms means that it's difficult to get an accurate and complete picture of individual local governments and the local government sector as a whole. 
This has led to some gaps in the department's understanding of the problems and issues facing local governments on a day-to-day -day level as well as over time. It also makes it a complex and manual process to pull together background information for senior executives and ministerial visits and for meetings with councils. Through the TWIG program, we were looking for a way to solve this problem and allow the department to use its data better to inform better decision-making and better support for councils. Risk Insights is an exciting small enterprise and the commitment and expertise that the team has demonstrated to solve our challenge has been really refreshing. They've certainly fulfilled more of our expectations than we initially thought possible. Our wealth of data is now at our fingertips, which gives our staff and key decision makers the ability to build better business intelligence. This intelligence will transform the way we make decisions and allow us to better target our assistance to local governments. The Testing Within Government program has given the department an opportunity to work with a small to medium enterprise to help solve this problem with a really innovative software solution. So imagine if we could automate the collection and analysis of our data, focusing our resources based on intelligence, adding to our evidence based by supplementing it with external data, reducing manual intervention, adding support to decision making. Imagine if we could do this in an agile, responsive partnership without the heavy chains of a tra traditional development process. Good morning, uh, my name is Brock Shears, I'm from the Department of Infrastructure, Local Government Planning. I'm joined here today by Conor McGarity and Yusuf Muller of uh, Risk Insights. So the department needed an inwardly focused system which supports program resource allocation and capacity building activities to support local governments. Our project has resulted in a fit for purpose solution to monitor the performance in the local government sector. Okay, so the department obviously has a big imagination. Uh, we're just a small business. Uh, but what we did have in common and where we were on the same page is in terms of finding solutions beyond the obvious. So over the 12 weeks, we worked with Dilgip to make its imagined statements a reality. Here are five fundamentals that we found as we, that made our project successful. Number one, co-location throughout the project. This was a critical success factor and fostered collaboration from day one. Number two, we built a shared understanding early of what we wanted to achieve. We did this through an initial discovery exercise whereby we understood what stories the data was trying to tell us and how we could apply them. Thirdly, there was a dedicated project team. This meant that we were able to quickly acquire data through internal channels and also removed a lot of potential barriers further down the track. Fourthly, the prototyping approach itself, and I know a couple of the other speakers have spoken about that. Early feedback on our preliminary analysis created instant value for the project and it also generated goodwill among the internal stakeholders. And finally, the freedom to alter the course. So taking the agile approach here. If after a two week sprint, we find that we were veering slightly off course, but we're still creating value and benefits, then we ram on it. If however, after the two weeks, we hadn't achieved anywhere near what we thought we were gonna achieve, no big deal, kill it, move on. Um, we found this approach really liberating and meant that we could be bold in designing functionality of the solution. So how did the project actually go? Uh, so we kicked off on day one with a catalogued set of data ready for us to use straight away, and that set the scene for the project. Um, at a high level, what we did was we harnessed knowledge from within the department, from some external agencies, uh, and used Risk Insights own experience to determine what it is that we were gonna look at and, and target the relevant sector domains. We then ingested and cleansed and blended the data. This was over 60 sources of data, both structured and unstructured, internal and open. We then profile the data to determine quality levels uh, with a focus on those quality aspects that would enable the intelligence that we wanted to obtain. Um, some of the data sets were not complete or not sufficiently granular, so an ancillary benefit of the project was the identification of improvements in quality and in capture. We then conducted complex analysis to provide insights. Uh, some of those insights supported previously uh, conducted analysis, some of it aligned with gut feel, um, some of it actually provided a brand new view. And finally, we created a roadmap for the solution. So the screenshots that are playing behind me represent a fraction of the outputs that were produced, sensitive data has been masked, uh, and the heavy lifting at the back end completely abstracted. 
So that's broadly what we did, but what made our solution innovative or what were some of its new or advanced um, features? So firstly, well, we've actually enlivened dormant data. Uh, so what the department had was a lot of um, data that had been collected over the course of a long period of time, which had either been underutilized or had not been utilized at all, um, or in fact was sitting there, but its potential had not been realized um, as a source to inform decision making. Uh, we followed data into three primary um, risk domains. So what that did was provide clarity around why we were actually collecting that data in the first instance. And even more importantly for the department, it gives them an evidence base um, with which to make future uh, informed decisions. So what do I mean by that? So to give you a bit of an example, um, if there's a new grant funding round for the 77 councils in Queensland, we now have gathered all, uh, all of that particular information into one place and that intelligence um, is uh, ready at hand if the department needs to make a decision vis-a-vis -vis any particular council. Thirdly, the scalability of our solution. So we can continually build on the existing intelligence profiles we've built for each and every, built for each and every council, uh, but it also allows the department to move to a more proactive rather than reactive approach to how it goes about its business. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the key analyses that we perform are now consistent and repeatable. And this obviously frees up um, officers to focus on the higher order decision making tasks. So what has that brought the department? Um, three, uh, the immediate benefit is a tool alerting us of the critical needs and at-risk councils and informing us in areas we know some councils struggle like financial report, reporting and program management. In the medium term, it is for designing future capacity building programs, surfacing and identifying lead indicators and informing us of the focus of assistance that we'll give to councils. And in the long term, the three main areas are one, informing the driving and driving the strategic policy environment, improving the state's risk posture by fostering a culture where understanding the value of risk adds significant value, and three, fostering collaborative relationships with like-minded agencies and the local government sector. So we started off looking to build a solution that promotes risk and performance monitoring to enable intelligence-led evidence-based decision-making, a solution that was scalable, and adaptable and importantly enabled users to leverage the capability of advanced and emerging data and analytics technologies. The program helped us towards um, achieving that goal, going from a minimum viable product to a business ready solution within 12 weeks. And it also enabled us to showcase how we partner with clients to provide solutions, um, harnessing our extensive experience in risk, governance and data. So the desired system is now a reality. One analytics platform, readily accessible evidence base, uh, future focused programs and importantly, a phase program of monitoring and responding to the performance of the local government sector. And from Risk Insight's perspective, uh, over the 12 weeks we identified exciting new opportunities to build out the capabilities of our solution, so including mobile enablement for on the go intelligence gathering identification of new high value uh, open source data sets that will really en enrich the level of analysis that we can provide to our clients. And thirdly, new use cases for some of our forecasting and predictive analytics capability. But in summary, uh, the project allowed us to demonstrate the art of the possible, uh, providing insights that are deeper and more joined up. But I'd be remiss of us, I guess, not to thank the Twig team, uh, Mark, Maria, Steph, uh, Shane and Peter, and the Dilgip team, Max, Jean, and especially Brock. Their dedication, support, and input along the journey um, was a testament to the value of the Twig program to help uh, SMEs like Risk Insights uh, to work better with the Queensland Government. But finally, I just want to leave you with a little challenge. So if you can consider what untapped value resides within your data and how that can be surfaced to enhance your decision making and to mitigate your risk, We'd be happy to have those conversations with you. We're just over in the corner right here, booth number eight. Thank you and good morning. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Spina, uh, the Assistant Director General for Digital Productivity and Services within the Department of Science, IT and Innovation. Queensland State Archives faces a dilemma uh, that affects many heritage institutions. 
We hold within our collection incredible stories, treasured images and historic items that can help us understand what it means and what it is to be a Queenslander. Yet sharing those stories as widely as possible can be difficult. We currently rely on a variety of social media platforms and an archival focused database. So how do we get those stories out to the widest audience possible? How do we get our state's great history into the hands of the people? Let me introduce you to a mobile first prototype, Discovering Queensland, produced in collaboration with Gaia Resources. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Andrew from Queens and State Archives. Sadly, Morgan couldn't be here today from Gaia Resources, but he will make an appearance on the screen in a moment, live from Fiji, apparently. Uh, at Queens and State Archives, we're passionate about sharing the stories and treasures hidden within our incredible collection. Stories that inform Queenslanders of who we were and who we are. Currently, we're reliant on our archival database and website, that, though comprehensive, denies us the ability to share the great stories within our collection. We also use social media, currently achieving over 2 million accesses per year, but these interactions offer little about story and deny the users the ability to browse our collection. So here's Morgan to explain to you, like from future, as I say, how we got overcome that problem. Thank you. So we started approaching this problem by looking at what was inside the collection. There are some amazing records, there's some amazing history in there, but a lot of it's not easily accessible. However, the photographic collection says a lot about the state. You don't really need to know a whole lot about the context, yet a lot of stories are already being told by just looking at these photos. So we thought, we really needed to build some stories around this content. We're building a story bridge here. So here's a great example. This is Townsville in the 1960s, the main street there. So you can already tell a lot about the uh, time by just looking at that photo. Here's the modern view. And you can tell a lot about how much that street has changed. Some buildings are exactly the same. There's some new ones. There's different cars. There's different people. There's different dress. So we thought, over time, we can have a look at that evolve. So we applied our products. Now, we work in the glam sector, and here are some of the products that we typically use. These are the ones we thought would best fit, because we've used a Drupal 8 fit, A and WA in Tasmania. We thought it could work in Queensland too. So right away, we took a base product that we've used elsewhere, and we um, applied it to the content. We took some photos and immediately put it into that framework, and we had something pretty plain to look at. But nevertheless, we took that content and we started testing. In fact, there were five rounds of testing over the 12 weeks. The first round, we got some great advice about what type of content they'd like to see. And as we did more and more content, we started refining the product. Here's another early iteration of the product. Over time, it kept changing and we kept adding more content. The testing stats were fantastic. We got, we got it out to 575 people who looked at 14,000 pages and the average visit time was nine minutes. So here's the product as it stands today. There's two major ways of navigating the content. One's over time, the other's through a map. So here's the timeline. All of the photos are organized chronologically here. I should say this is actually a mobile first product. So I highly recommend that you go to our stall and have a look at how it behaves on tablets and phones. And there's a link at the end that you can uh, visit. Nevertheless, back on the timeline, you uh, keep scrolling until you find something that looks a bit interesting or a time that you've uh, got a bit of interest in. So once you've found that, you uh, click on it and or tap on it, and that takes you through to a listing. The photographs themselves are uh, mapped to a latitude and longitude and perspective that does a call to the Google Maps API Street View and brings back a, a modern perspective. All of the photos have got links to other uh, photos that are like this and they're all categorized. So once you've found something, you can then look at similar categories. Here's a street scene. Um, there's other categories, bridges, floods, uh, street views, views, and uh, depending on what you're interested in, you can kind of serendipitously go through all of the themes and find things that are interested to, uh, interesting to you. So um, as, as you go through and you find some interesting content, you uh, get a bit of an idea about how the city or that place in Queensland or that town has evolved and changed over time. Here's a fantastic view of the Brisbane riverfront. It has changed somewhat. So I did talk about categories, but it's also organized by time. So here's the decade, the 1880s, and here's from what's in the collection in that time period. This links through to the map. 
So once you go to the map view, we've got all of the locations clustered. Um, we have a statewide reach in this product for the 130 odd photos that are in this subset. But of course, there is a lot more in the Brisbane CBD. Um, here's an example of the trades hall. Um, you can navigate to wherever you want in the state and find things that you're interested in. Now, one other thing I should mention about the map is it's broken down by time. So I can filter in a particular time period and uh, find out what's there. So I'm going out to Charters Towers now, and there's a few photos from the late 19th century Charters Towers. And here I can have a look at how much that city has changed over the years. So as I said, we did a lot of our testing and we got fantastic feedback. People really like the categorization, they like the maps, they like the timeline. Uh, there were some great, fan, uh, great suggestions about how we could improve it over time and we tried to implement as many of them as we could over the time that we had. Um, I should also say there's an API. So we're not saying we can present the content the best, so we've opened it up and other people can consume that content and that context and show it the way they want on the Creative Commons. Well, thanks to, uh, to Morgan, Gordon, I know you said that, that would be very nice uh, To wrap up our presentation, I'd like to briefly discuss two final points. Finally, uh, firstly, a major learning outcome for us as an organisation was how liberating the iterative approach can be. Normally, when implementing a digital product for public consumption, we go direct from A to Z and cross our fingers that the audience will like it. However, our audience on this occasion were part of the development team, guiding, advising, and identifying how we could develop a product that met their needs as much as it met ours. In terms of future development, of which we have a number of ambitions, one recurring idea from testing and feedback was creating space within the platform for other Queensland historical and cultural institutions to share their own treasures and stories, giving regional and remote communities representation, which in turn offers our audience a richer experience of our state-shared history and what it means to be a Queenslander. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, please feel free, as Morgan said, to check out our prototype on the URL. Uh, thank you to the Twig team and to City for helping us make this key project for us a reality. And thank you for your time today. So thank you again to our, uh, our panel two participants. Again, I think you'll agree there's some very exciting and very interesting uh, demonstrations and products that are there. So again, if you could show your appreciation for all of the... Um, <laughs> um, we'll certainly run slightly behind time, so I'm going to try and do the MC thing and try and pick up some time. So I just want to limit the questions here to just two quick questions if we can. And any questions you have in relation to the TWIG program itself, I should have mentioned this earlier, we'll just hold those to the, uh, to the end of the final panel session. So do we have any questions from the audience, please? Don't be shy. I'm not discouraging questions now. <laughs> Nothing. Okay, I'll uh, have to ask Dorothy Dixon then. Um, so just in relation to the heavy vehicle rest area application, I guess the question there is, what do you think the take-up rate will be for that application? Thanks, Dallas. So um, I think one of the, the key items of feedback from um, the consultation was undertaken was that uh, the product needed to be free of charge, um, which it is. Um, and I think bearing in, so that, that will obviously help encourage the, the take up. Um, but one of the things to bear in mind is that the data set that we've provided is just for Queensland. So there's, a, I think, a real opportunity here um, with other um, jurisdictional data sets for rest area um, information um, that the product can be expanded to a national product. Obviously freight doesn't um, have jurisdictional boundaries so there's I think an opportunity here that the take up rate could be significantly enhanced as well if the product uh, gets further developed as a, as a nationwide app. Uh, just also on that, we did try to speak to some of the drivers, understand what their risks and concerns were and incorporated those into the design to make sure that we catered for those. And the operators that we spoke to also said that they would be very happy to take that into their toolbox talks and actually as an organisation recommend and get the drivers to install that. Uh, so the, those um, operators I think uh, will be quite useful and we also have 
the guys from Big Rig, which is a trucking magazine, are also happy to cover it and, and push it at launch. So it is something we've been very much concerned with, and we have a multi-value application that even with small user base, there's value, but as more people use it, it becomes more valuable. Thank you. Now, time for one quick question from the audience. One up the uh, back, left-hand side. Um, again, on the um, on the pro route. Um, sorry, yeah. In that, do do the drivers get like an alert? Say, if they're five kilometres out from a rest area, like, is there a beep on their phone so that they can then make a decision of, yep, why don't I pull over? Um, so at this point, no. Um, because that would require us to do active tracking. We think that uh, that's a future extension that's already sort of being discussed. Uh, we have some other future extensions like voice interactions, for example, where they just talk to the phone so they don't actually touch the phone, so they can ask a question and can respond. But most of those are a bit further away. At, right now, the, I think there's a little bit of concern and we need to prove value without the active tracking, which we would need to do in order to do some of those features and functions. So we're trying to get adoption first. Okay, thank you. So thanks to panel two. Thank you very much. Give another round of applause. So as panel two exit the stage, I would like to, uh, it's uh, midway through our proceedings, I'd like to introduce and welcome to the stage Professor Marek Kovalkiewicz. Uh, he's the Professor and PwC Chair in Digital Economy at QUT. He's our special guest and speaker. Professor Kovalkiewicz is an academic and industry leader with extensive experience in conducting academic sound research uh, co innovating with industry and university partners and delivering innovative products to the market. Uh, currently, as head of the PwC Chair in Digital Economy at QUT, he leads the research agenda to inform and influence a robust digital economy in Australia. Americ manages a contemporary research portfolio and converts industry driven opportunities into research outcomes of global relevance. So, Marek, if you could make your way to the stage, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, it's the first time I've heard my, my surname pronounced in a very, very proper way in Australia. Thank you so much for that. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I sometimes introduce myself as Marek Kowalkiewicz. It's just a bit easier. Marek Kowalkiewicz. Uh, I moved to, to Brisbane, to Queensland, about two years ago from a small place uh, in California. The town is called Mountain View. Some of you might be aware there's a few interesting companies living, uh, being headquartered there. Um, but I love it much more here because, you know, what we've just seen, the presentations, the projects, they're absolutely, absolutely impressive. And, um, you know, I guess I'm still trying to learn a bit about, you know, what Brisbane, Queensland really is. I'm still trying to understand the concept of casual Fridays uh, in, uh, in, in Australia, but I guess I'm getting there. Um, I had a team called uh, PwC Chair in Digital Economy at QUT. That's a QUT team of researchers that is sponsored by PwC, by Queensland government, and also by Brisbane City Council or Brisbane Marketing. It's a collaboration of industry, government, and academia in addressing the challenges, the opportunities, uh, opportunities that we're seeing in digital economy. Over the past two years, since I uh, joined and effectively initiated the team, uh, we've been running uh, a number of projects, effectively back-to-back -back projects that help uh, our partners, governments, other organizations address the bigger challenges, the bigger opportunities that, that, might, that they might have. And we do call them innovation sprints. Uh, they're slightly different than, say, Google Sprints. They are inspired by, uh, by Google Sprints as, as one of the sources of inspiration. And I wanted to give you um, a few examples or tell you a bit about the lessons that we've learned over uh, the two years, over about 15 sprints, uh, sprints that we have uh, run. Uh, Queensland government is one of our most important partners and many of those sprints have, done, have been done together, together with Queensland government. One lesson that I learned uh, over the past two years is that the government is extremely open to being challenged in terms of their understanding of what their problem really is. And I've heard some of those comments uh, uh, already here 
uh, in the room. Uh, in my team, we love to, see, uh, to show this photo, and many of you would, would have seen this photo and perhaps uh, commenting on this photo. Uh, this is how my team likes to think about the world. When we, when we uh, see a situation like that, we're asking ourselves, what's the problem here? And the answer is obvious. That's, there's a problem of distracted driving here, assuming that the car is moving. There's a problem of distracted driving. Um, and uh, many of us try to and approach it and say, okay, let's solve the problem of distracted driving. Uh, but really what we need to, uh, to, to do is go a bit deeper or dig a bit, uh, bit deeper and try to understand what exactly are we trying to do. Now we are being conditioned to think that the problem here, or that the distraction is the mobile phone and the coffee cup. And that's the right answer. Uh, but, if you, but if you dig a bit deeper, you might get to a conclusion that in certain cases, the distraction is the car. And rather than trying to remove the coffee cup or the mobile phone from the photo, we should be working on removing the car from the picture. It's a very important point uh, that I'm trying to make here, that often, and that happens with any partners, Queensland government, Brisbane City Council, organizations, they come to us, they come to us and ask us, can you help us remove the mobile phone and the coffee cup from the picture? And we spend a lot of time working on truly and deeply understand the, uh, understand the problem. And often we come back to our partners and say, are you really sure you want to remove the coffee cup or the mobile phone uh, from the picture? It's actually a relatively easy exercise the moment we, uh, we engage in, in truly deep understanding of our customers. What this lady in the photo really wants to be doing is quite likely engaging with her friends and, and, and having coffee rather than driving. So he, she might actually be much more happy if we do indeed remove the car, uh, the car from the picture. So solving the right problem is one of the, uh, one of the important challenges for us. Uh, we do, and some of you might, might recognize images like this one. When we started our innovation sprints, we followed the so-called double diamond approach. Uh, but then we thought, you know, diamonds are good, well, let's just add another one. Um, so we have a triple diamond approach, and this is how we work right now. We have those three stages. Uh, stage number one, this is what I already told you about, this is all about understanding and defining the problem, solving the right problem. Uh, it takes us usually a lot of time and we do engage with a lot of stakeholders to make sure we truly know what the problem is. Stage number two, explore and refine, is where we bring user insights, where we bring technical expertise or academic understanding of the area, as well as business acumen or, uh, or business approach to, uh, to, a, uh, to a problem. That uh, second stage, that second diamond, is where you would typically use uh, approaches such as design thinking. This is where a lot of ideation happens, this is where a lot of prototyping happens, this is where a lot of exploration happens. But it only happens uh, once we've truly understand what we want to achieve. And the third diamond, uh, we, we always had it, but we just never knew that that, that was there uh, you know, officially. Um, um, so what we've always been focusing on um, is to make sure that in whatever Pro, uh, project we have, and out of the 15 projects that we've had, about 50 of them have already resulted with implementation that is available to customers and citizens. Think about it, it's about a 50% success rate, which for innovation uh, is, is relatively high. So the, the third diamond for us is a very short message, and this is, there is no handover of our projects. Uh, hand, handover never happens. In fact, uh, when we start our work, it's the diamond on the left. This is where we're already working with implementation teams. We're already working with future owners of solutions, futures, uh, future owners of products. They are part of the entire process, and I will share a trick uh, uh, that we do with you, or with our, uh, I'll share it with you, the trick we do with our clients. Uh, we try to make them convinced that whatever ideas come out of our projects, our processes are their ideas. They own those ideas from the very beginning. We actually, we might try to influence the ideas, but it's our partners, it's our clients who truly come up with solutions. We're just there to help. Uh, and it seems to be working. Uh, we also have um, uh, one uh, additional approach, and that's the fourth out of four lessons that, that we've learned that I wanted to share with you. 
Uh, we learned that it is okay to come with your tool set, to come with your mindset. Uh, in my team, we have a number of hammers, if you will. You know, the hammers that you take and you, you look for nails. Every, everything looks like a nail if what you have in your, hammer, in your hand is a hammer. And it's absolutely okay. We, this is one of our hammers. Uh, our hammer is called Proactive Organization. As an academic group, we're looking into approaches of making services proactive. In other words, we're trying to uh, find solutions where services are delivered to customers, to citizens, even before uh, customers or citizens request them. Part of our research is to make sure that this is not creepy. Uh, so we do, uh, we do recognize some challenges there, but in fact we do come with our mindset, with our, uh, with our hammer. That's basically uh, uh, through understanding that every problem has a myriad of solutions and, uh, and there's, some, there's going to be only one that, that you're going to provide or we're going to provide uh, and therefore it's okay to have, uh, to have a focused approach or a hammer. Um, our sprints, uh, and you're not supposed to read this slide, right, so just, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, small, small fonts, it's okay. Our sprints are roughly having the design thinking part in the center of the screen, that's what you're seeing. They in total take six weeks and we've over two, uh, two years learned that six weeks is the ideal period. We spent two weeks on understanding the problem. We spent two weeks on the, the sprints that were mentioned uh, also here. And we spent the last two weeks on conceptualizing and capturing all of the learnings and making sure that everything is documented and that we can, uh, we can learn from that. What I'm extremely proud of is that uh, through using our hammers, through using uh, our lenses, we've actually been able to influence the vocabulary of uh, some of our partners. So you'll see in the upper right corner that uh, with Queensland government we're developing pers personalized and proactive services. The proactive part is the vocabulary that, that we, we were able to introduce and, and, and have our partners and clients think like that. So, so once again, it is okay to have a very particular focus, a very particular mindset. Um, I don't have too much time to, to walk you through a lot of examples. Uh, since this is testing within government, and I just wanted to show you two examples of what is already live and out there. Uh, this is a, uh, a website that supports uh, uh, entrepreneurs who want to open coffee shops in Brisbane or Logan. Uh, and uh, by applying the proactive government approach, all you need to do is you need to go there and tell the government a bit about what you want to do, sell food, sell alcohol, and so on. And, uh, and once you've done it, uh, you will start receiving proactive messages saying, hey, this is the license you need to apply for, hey, this is the, uh, 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 the payment you need to make, and so on and so on. And we've done uh, a bit of research in the past before running this sprint. We've heard some, uh, some interesting stories from entrepreneurs who had to pay a lot of money to, 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 to get some support in navigating through uh, government processes. Uh, we've heard stories of uh, mistakes made uh, just uh, because they were not, uh, mm, they didn't know uh, what uh, specific um, licenses they needed to apply for and so on. So this is already available. Uh, just you know, opening cafe in Brisbane, when you type it in in Google, you'll, sign, uh, you'll find that site on top of the search results. Uh, the other one is, a, a, once again, a very proactive approach, a, a site that helps you uh, find funding from Advanced Queensland, but also other support pro programs in Queensland. Uh, again, a proactive approach where all you need to do is answer a, a couple of simple questions, who you are, what you're trying to achieve, and you'll start receiving information on uh, programs available. This particular uh, screenshot is, is very, very dear to me because there's, there's something on this screenshot that, to my knowledge, and I've done a, a, a bit of research about governments around the world, no government around the world has done so far. Uh, this is the yellow bar which effectively says, hey, we're trying something new here. If you don't like this site, you can still use our traditional services. So it's a better version of a government service. Imagine if something like that was put up on the census site, for instance. We would all understand if it went down, right? Uh, but no, of course, we said that, you know, this is uh, a, a very, very 
a reliable site. It doesn't have to be like that, right? Governments are also okay to say, look, we're trying something new. Thank you very much. I hope uh, the, 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 our lessons that I've uh, shared with you are going to be useful um, for your organizations and I wish you all the best. I actually would love to collaborate with some of you. We do not implement uh, what, uh, what we come up with. We work with other partners who are the best partners to do that. So I'd love to have some conversations and I'll be uh, roaming around after the sessions. Thank you once again. Thanks, Merrick. It's been a real privilege to have you here today, and uh, I practiced your surname for days. No, I didn't actually. We've got a, we've got a few Bosnians in the team, so the, their surnames are 140 characters long, so Kovakovic is like Smith in comparison. Now, I'd like to um, welcome Team Tom onto the stage. We had Team Peter before, so uh, we now have our third panel members join us on stage. So as they make their way up the stairs, um, I hope they're working on the safety assessment on those stairs. Um, we have Patient Zero in the Department of Education and Training who have been collaborating on an innovative identity management solution for independent schools uh, to access state school and e-learning resources. We also have Max Kelson and Queensland Health who have been focusing on linking big data and applying um, machine learning to improve patient journeys. And we have Truy in the Department of Science, Information, Technology and Innovation uh, who have been working on an innovative dashboard to display open data in a more accessible format. So we'd like to welcome our panel three on stage. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mick O'Leary, the Department of Education and Training's Chief Information Officer. Next year's Commonwealth Games are an exciting opportunity for our state. When we looked into how to get our schools to embrace the Games, teachers and educators had a number of ideas and activities they wanted to share. We knew that the use of some smart technology would be the best way to reach all students throughout Queensland. But there was a problem. The technology that supports state schools is different to the technology that supports independent and Catholic schools. We had to come up with a single technology solution that all schools could use. Our solution had to maintain the high security and privacy standards that parents and caregivers of our students had come to expect. The TWIG program gave us the opportunity to ask the market to come up with innovative ideas. And they did. When we're done, almost one million Queensland school students and their teachers will gain access to the GC 2018 Embrace Learning. This web app will offer exciting educational resources about the Commonwealth Games aligned to the Australian curriculum. Because of the app, all Queensland schools will benefit from a global learning environment where they can collaborate and share resources like never before. While I'm excited by the app, I'm more excited by its potential to keep schools connected and collaborating. Thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Sean Sharp. I'm from the Department of Education and Training. Uh, as Mick said, um, the, the uh, Embrace Learning website gave us a real opportunity to, to share um, the learning application to non-state schools as well as our schools. The application itself, it's, uh, it, it's an area where you can curate, uh, if you're a state school uh, student or teacher, you can curate some learning applications and some learning um, uh, material for the specific needs of your students, but unless you are in that state school environment, you're not able to gain access for that curation. The public can access the material on there, but that enhanced level of access isn't available. When we launched the site in, uh, in August this year, it was our most liked uh, thing on our, on our Facebook page with over 63,000 likes. Now, um, uh, it was that context that brought us to Patient Zero and to bring it. Um, some things that we learned through that, um, through that experience was to help uh, the department unlock the natural innovation that comes from uh, engaging with the smaller um, uh, SMEs in the, in the market environment. It also gave us a chance to unite two vendors that were working on two separate uh, products uh, to develop something new and something creative without actually interrupting the, uh, the core product that we were trying to deliver. Now, the 12-week program was a bit of a challenge for us. Um, um, you know, it's a big place, like education, and trying to maintain those high-level security standards was tough. But having said that, I mean, we're, we're still committed to the product and to, and to this, uh, and to taking this pilot further than the 12-week program. So our next steps will be looking to move into a commercial environment with Patient Zero, uh, should, that be, uh, should the product um, uh, uh, finalize its proof of concept. And the second step would be to um, get a, 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 a non-state school schools to uh, join us in our testing environment. Now, can I introduce Brendan, please, for Patient Zero. Thanks. 
So uh, GLE is a public website that allows um, state school students to log in. And um, what you don't see here is that the, um, the private schools and, um, and uh, independent schools can access GLE to, to curate that content. And so government, in our experience, is really in the connections business. And this project is all about connecting private schools with state government resources. It's something that we're very proud to be part of. And the way that we've solved that is through PZ Portal. So um, if, we, if we, you'll see behind me um, on the screen a video of, of the application working. And what we're aiming to do is actually to, look, to, look, to deliver a, a full working application um, that was integrated into the government's environment. Um, this presented a number of technical challenges. Um, as Sean mentioned, there were multiple vendors engaged in the program. Um, we had to kick off work inside of um, the department and into other vendors, which took some time to, to get back to us. Um, so we had to keep ourselves busy and occupied in the interim. And what you're seeing behind us here is actually um, a solution which allows the state um, education department to delegate responsibility of management of the students and teacher records to the private schools. And we do that by a number of ways. So you see here that we're creating a, a student and a teacher manually via the portal. Um, and this is good to get started for the, the schools to start testing. We also offer a CSV file upload so they can bulk upload the, the list of students and teachers. Or our recommended solution is what we've called bring your own identity, where we actually federate the identity system that the school has with the state government's uh, solution so that students can get a, a seamless single sign-on from their desktop. So once users have, um, have been uh, invited to use a solution, um, they receive an email, they set their password, and at this point they're logged into PZ Portal. And from here they can um, progress into a variety of different e-learning applications. Um, the first e-learning application is, is GLE, um, and teachers get a very specific view. And I guess part of the, the pivoting process that we had to go through is, as part of this engagement was actually learning about GLE and its capabilities. Um, and GLE is actually capable of allocating work to students. So we learned that signing the students in wasn't actually enough by itself. We actually had to um, indicate which students belong to which classes and then give that information uh, to GLE via an API so that the student and teachers um, could actually collaborate together on this. We uh, also broken some introductions into um, to Catholic education um, and into um, Lutheran and, and Anglican sectors. And there is great uh, interest in, the, in these um, independent schools to actually get access to the resources that the state government offers. And this is something that, um, that the teachers of, of Queensland should be very excited about because it can help them um, reduce the amount of planning and, and effort they, they need to do. So um, I think this project for us has been a great example of how you can work with government, how you can be innovative, and how you can be agile. But given a compressed time frame and, and, the, um, and the security nature of this product, uh, we were a bit hesitant as to how we would actually uh, achieve all those, those standards ourselves. So we've actually um, brought in a, a third party vendor called Okta, which actually sits in the background um, it stores the identities of the students, it's responsible for single sign-on, and it can help us do things like federation. And that product really helps up, uh, us uplift our capability in terms of security. Um, and I guess we're really just wrapping around the edges and providing the, the seamless customer experience that we need to create while leveraging the security capabilities of a third-party product. So we often see governments undergoing significant change, and I think solutions like uh, PZ Portal for single sign-on can help with that. I think uh, programs like Twig really help demonstrate what you can achieve in a short time frame. Um, when, you, when you take the shackles off and, and let uh, SME um, really have a crack at a government problem, and I suppose as, as Patient Zero, our specialty is in creating products and, and doing identity management projects. So this was an ideal um, niche area for us to actually sink our teeth into. Uh, learnings for us is, um, is the challenges of going through development, test and production cycles with government. Um, it, it caused our program to, to be slightly delayed as we tried to engage with schools and also get the schools engaged to actually start testing the product. And so that was something we wanted to achieve but we weren't able to yet. Um, and we're looking forward to actually achieving that into the future um, with some state schools. 
uh, with some private schools uh, interacting uh, with the platform so we can get that feedback that some of the other groups have got uh, once we go through um, the relevant checks that we need to because this is a, obviously a very secure um, uh, solution that, that needs to be uh, verified quite heavily. Um, so thank you for your attention. Hi, my name is Cathy Ford. I'm the Chief Digital Officer of eHealth Queensland. To make Queenslanders amongst the healthiest people in the world by 2026, the Queensland Government will face significant challenges. These include pressures on the health system such as demographic changes, growth in the rates of chronic diseases, changing technology and treatments and finite financial resources. The key to solving these health challenges rests with one of the largest digital assets in Queensland, its data. Now is the time to unlock the potential of this data. To push ourselves further, we are now looking in the rear vision mirror by analysing longitudinal trends to turn our data assets into insights and predict the road ahead. Our investment in the TWIG project has recognised that an insight is only as good as the foundations on which it is built. And the foundational work enabler is data linkage, which represents a platform for longitudinal health studies, epidemiological surveillance on rare diseases, the examination of variations in healthcare, and the capture and comparison of healthcare costs across populations and over time. Importantly, this project has been a collaboration between Metro North HHS, the state's largest hospital and health service, the successful SME, Max Kelson, and the city. Putting these pieces together and deriving insights is now helping inform decision-making around every patient's outcome. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Davis. I am the director of a unit in Metro North HHS, which has um, clinical data analytics. I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce the patient continuum project that we've been part of um, at, to date. Um, this, we're very excited by the potential of um, the patient continuum and really see this um, as the beginning of a process and a journey of um, utilising the um, strengths of data linkage and working with partners in eHealth Queensland and Queensland Health um, to continue the journey. I'll just introduce my colleague Alex O'Reilly who will go into a bit more detail and then Max Kelson, the company, will, um, Stan from Max Kelson will go um, give a presentation about the product that's been developed. The Pareto principle and the challenge for this project was that we spend 80% of our time doing 20% of the analytics. And we spend 80% of our time doing uh, disparate linkage of structured, semi-structured, unstructured uh, data sets that change over time. So the solution we were looking for was something that automated this process and scaled it for analytics. Uh, before handing over to Sam, I'd just like to say that one thing about Twig uh, that was really good as opposed to doing this in existing business models was that it opened a lot of doors that internally were closed to us. So I think that's a big benefit for Tweet. That's it. Thank you, Alex. Hi, my name is Samuel and I'm the COO at Max Kelson. Max Kelson is a software engineering and analytics agency specialising in machine learning. And we were very excited to be able to tackle this problem statement and very fortunate to be able to have such strong partners in Elizabeth, Alex, and the Metro North team. As Alex mentioned, the problem statement was simple, yet interesting. How do you take disparate data sets that contain siloed information about the patient's care and stitch it together to form a rich patient continuum that chronicles a patient's journey in and out of hospital. When we approached this problem, we wanted it to be a foundational investment, one that was scalable, automated, and easy to use. The data that we had to work with came from a number of departments in a variety of formats. This data was huge and had previously been linked and analyzed in Excel. Now, it's a testament to Alex, Linton, and the team 
that they were able to use Excel in this way. But unfortunately, due to hardware, software, and other manual aspects of the solution, we had to move away from spreadsheets and implement a program solution. So we developed a custom linking algorithm using a programming language built to handle big data that took the de-identified information and stitched it together to form a rich patient continuum. We then took this output and connected it to Click, the business intelligent platform that Queensland Health used. This took the process from three weeks down to three minutes and created a solution that was not only scalable and automated, but gave us a platform to add additional data sets during the 12-week program. Due to a clearly defined scope by the Metro North team, we were able to complete this aspect of the work early in the 12 weeks. And then this gave us the opportunity to extend the scope and demonstrate how other machine learning techniques could solve problems in Queensland Health. The first thing we wanted to do was implement unstructured text analytics into the workflow. And Metro North were able to provide us with a perfect problem. When a patient is referred to hospital, their GP writes a referral note that, among other things, contains the reason that they were referred, known as the referred condition. We developed a custom text extraction algorithm that detected a list of referred conditions from these referral notes and then extracted them and placed them in an output that was easy to analyse from Alex and his team. This was a complicated process as we had to deal with things like complicated medical uh, information as well as doctor's shorthand. For example, a fracture is denoted by a hashtag. The second thing we did was explore predictive modelling. And we applied a variety of machine learning techniques to the data that we had with the view to predict length of stay based on what we knew about patients when they entered hospital. So this could be a primary diagnosis, a referred condition, or age, gender, and even the day and time that they were admitted. While there is definitely some correlation between the data and a length of stay, we believe that the more data we can apply to the model, the stronger the accuracy will become. But this does highlight the need to have strong linked data to be able to achieve things like predictive modelling. An example workflow of what the predictive modelling is looking like is shown here. On presentation, a patient suffering from diabetes will spend four hours in emergency. There is then a 78% chance that they'll have a stay of four days as an inpatient. This is the patient journey for diabetes sufferers in 40% of cases. And as a follow-up, they might have an average of seven outpatient appointments. This TWIG program has been a fantastic experience for us at Max Kelsen. Not only have we gained valuable experience working at a state government level, but we've also dealt with the intricacies and processes of dealing with Queensland Health. On that point, if there was one lesson that I've learned in this process, it's to investigate the government security and IT requirements as early as possible in the program so we can overcome them. As well, looking at the client tooling is also important. Our analytics team is very familiar with Tableau, but not as familiar with Click. We're going to continue the model and ensure that it's updated, and we would recommend to include additional data sets as and when they become available. I just wanted to say a thank you to the team from Twig for organising this fantastic journey, as well as for Metro North for having us involved. If anyone has any questions about our project or how your organisation or agency might benefit from automated data linking, free text analysis or predictive modelling, come have a chat to us at our booth. Have a great day. Thank you.
Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Spina. I'm the Assistant Director General for Digital Productivity and Services within the Department of Science, IT and Innovation. The Queenslanders, through open data and various departmental websites and annual reports, have access to a plethora of financial data. However, the data is stored across multiple systems and formats, including photos, PDFs, and it's actually hard to analyse. This is the problem we need to resolve, not only to improve discoverability of government's financial data, but also to be able to interpret it. Late last year, the government conducted industry and public consultation on its open data. One of the recommendations was for government to provide visualisation. Clearly, it is important for Queenslanders to see what our data shows us, about us. Using a collaborative, agile and iterative approach through the TWIG program, a solution to our problem has been developed by TRUI in 12 weeks. Good morning. My name's Teresa Harding and I'm from De City and I lead open data for Queensland Government. The Queensland Government has so much financial data available to the public in so many different formats. The real challenge is to find out what data do we need and what format could we use it in. True, we use their data wrangling and dashboard expertise to find the data that we wanted, cleaned it up, and there was a lot of cleaning up to do, and designed and created what we think is a really interesting and stimulating uh, data, an interactive data visualisation tool. True, we've also provided us advice on other ways that the government can maintain, keep and publish data. I'll hand you over now to Scott Walker. Hi everyone. During this tool would give Queenslanders public access to information which would otherwise be difficult to analyse and interpret, if not impossible, such as how our tax dollars are spent, where government sources its funds and, and how government engages with the community through grants and, and contract uh, spend. With interactive visualisation, Truly has taken the concept a step further by using technology to drill down into visualisations for more detail, interactively changing what data you see and how it's processed. I will now invite Dr Nick Marsh from Truly to demonstrate the product. Thanks, Scott and Teresa. So this kind of summarises what our problem was, really. So um, it's about 360-odd um, different sources of information from um, tables embedded within um, PDFs, um, uh, sourced from different locations around the Queensland Government website. And we wanted to come up with a way to let Average Joe um, interrogate this data, unwind the complexity that is um, the flow of finances within the state government. So before I show you the solution, though, I'll talk a bit about what TRUI is. So True is a browser-based data platform, and it's a place where you log in, you load up your data file, you invite your collaborators to join your data library, you manipulate, work on those files together, um, version controls maintained, the point of truth is maintained, you create dashboards with uh, maps, charts, analysis, share that with your team, publish it to the world as a public dashboard web page, or embed those visualisations elsewhere. The idea is about capturing the entire data workflow so that um, as the data is updated, the workflow flows through, the visualisations are always live and up to date. So the opportunity for us for this project uh, was to create some new widgets and new data visualisations. It's data that we hadn't been familiar with in the past. And to focus our attention on what sort of data visualisations would be appropriate, together with Scott and Teresa and the rest of the Twig team, we came up with a series of personas, the type of users that we're, we're aiming for with this website. So, in terms of showing you what our solution is, we're going to explore it through the eyes of two of our personas. So the first one is Yana. She's a local journalist. She just needs numbers to back up her stories. So the website, the top of the website, is a very high level figure. The flow of um, income from Queensland to Canberra and then back again. We can scroll down to look at, um, at the income side of things. You see only 46% of the state's revenue actually comes from the feds. We've got to raise those taxes through things like stamp duty or payroll tax, um, or as we're all familiar with, with royalties. And the lion's share of the royalties comes from coal mines we're familiar with. And there are other kind of less popular kind of sources of income as well, things like speeding camera fines, which we all contribute about $34 a year each to. So we look at the collective expenses at a high level. So I spend about $18 billion a year making payroll for the 200,000 employees on the books. And 
um, for grants and then supplies and services. Then we're going to have a look at this now at a departmental level as well. So we're scrolling around the inner ring here. We see um, the big departments, health, education and transport, about 70% of the total expenses, these smaller ones as well. So let's have a look at the city, the reason why we're all here today, and the guys who are buying you morning tea. Look under their grants program. So that's Yana sorted. Our next persona is Jake. He's a local builder. He doesn't care so much about this whole broader government malarkey, but he wants to know who's getting the contract work and, who, and which government departments they're handing it out. So we go down to our contracts and awards network diagram. There's about 96,000 different contracts and awards dealt with here. The outer ring, as you can see, um, covers off on each of the government agencies. The network shows their connection to the suppliers as the inner ring. Any of those departments or suppliers that you click on, you get a summarised view over on the right hand side, which you can download as well so we, to interrogate that data more, in more detail. Jake cares about construction. He's going to search for the word construction for any of those contracts. He's got a, a smaller list now of nearly 7,000 different construction based contracts. And in fact, Jake's been doing a bit of subcontracting work with the Kelly Group. It's working out pretty well for him. He wants to know what else they've got in their books. Type in Kelly. There's their collective uh, range of programs in the work. If you scroll down further on the page, you get a sense of where grants are distributed across the state, so where the money's being spent. So this is on a per person basis, this layer, so you can see the darker colours, those western, uh, remote and regional communities on a per person basis, they're doing pretty well, which is good to see. Or we can click across to the total amount, we can see where the major populations are here. And then if we scroll right to the bottom of the page, um, you'll get to see the sources for all the, the information that we managed to track down across the different government websites. And you can recreate this whole experience yourself if you want to wrangle those data files. So get your phone out, go to qld.govspend.info, it's a live site, share it with your friends, tell us about um, any feedback we'd love to hear. Um, and most of all, Scroll all the way to the bottom, click on the truey.com link, go and create a free forever account in Truey, have a look at our platform, see how it works for you. And if you want to use data and data driven decision making, come and talk to us, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Is that better? <laughs> yeah, just seeing stats there in terms of the average contribution for Queenslanders to speeding camera fines at $34. I think some of you guys aren't doing your bit because I just put in 258 the other day, so <laughs> you need to uh, not rely on me. Okay, so again, can I get you to give you a round of applause and thank all of the uh, <laughs> members of Channel 3? And um, to remind you to show your support on Twitter using the uh, hashtag AQTwig. And now it's time for questions from the audience again. So we have the reigning mics out there. Don't be shy, put your hand up. That one down the front here, thank you. Hi. Is it on? Yep. Uh, Craig Basie from Nova Systems. Could I ask a question of the um, the patient continuum part. Um, the way you describe doctors and the way they actually um, send letters into hospitals, the referral letters, and challenges in the way they write. Have you looked at going the other way, as in providing details back to the doctors on what they, the way they wrote to put it in there, and then also the outcomes that came, you know, as in if, if a guy's got knee pain, but it may be some referred pain from somewhere else, outcome later to say that this was your referral and this is what actually happened. Yeah, definitely. I think that the way that we like to build um, our models, our extraction models, is to work around the lexicon of our users. And so in this case, we don't really want to force doctors into writing in a way that they wouldn't normally, I guess, be comfortable writing in. And so for that aspect, it was an it's definitely an interesting uh, task reading through all the abbreviations and the shorthand and all the medical terms that they use 
but I think it's, that's what makes the system powerful because we don't have to then go back in there and have a big change management piece, getting them to learn a different system. As for your second point, yes, I mean, we would love to extend the system out across Queensland Health and eventually push it back into um, the pathways like GPs and other specialists. Uh, and it's definitely possible. Just to also say that um, our um, outpatient system, so those referrals coming to outpatients, they collect information on the type of clinic but not the type of the referred condition of the patient when they've been referred. So it's trying to look back through systems that don't actually collect that information at present, though we have plans within um, Queensland Health to, to roll that out, um, for systems to be developed that can do that. But at this point, um, we don't have that in Metro North. So this gives us the ability to actually see what type of patients are referred and what the clinics and what the conditions are. And that's information we haven't been able to, to be able to look at in the past. So it's very, very, very useful for us if we can do that. So time for one further question, otherwise we might, uh, we might make up some time and move on. So any volunteers for questions? No, then I encourage you to uh, visit the, uh, the booths at the um, end of the session. So, again, can you thank uh, panel three as they look at the stage? And as uh, panel three exit the stage, uh, if we can give a warm welcome to ATEC and the Department of State Development who have been working on a cloud-based story solution to effectively manage collections of images and videos and V2I in the Department of Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning who have been focusing on using augmented reality to compare and visualise neighbourhood models. Uh, also invited on stage Maria Kenner who is the Testing Within Government Project Manager. Any questions that you might have at the end of this panel session on the Twig program itself. So now Maria's going to have to be uh, very clever here because she's been our timekeeper and now she's on the panel as well. So she's going to have to keep uh, time on herself as, uh, as well as the panel. So over you guys, thank you. Hi, I'm Michael McKee, Deputy Director General of Business Solutions and Partnerships with the Department of State Development. We're delighted to be part of this year's TWIG program as part of the Queensland Government's Advanced Queensland Initiative. As State Development, we're driving the economic development program for Queensland by creating a diverse and thriving economy and generating jobs. Pivotal to our actions is a strong commitment to driving innovation as we work with new and existing industry and small business. We help them build their capabilities and help them realise their potential. The TWIG initiative allowed us to work collaboratively with Queensland SME to develop a bespoke digital asset management solution that would scale to our growing needs. Our project team really enjoyed working closely with ATEC and the city's project team and are proud to present a digital asset management solution. Hi everyone, I'm Tanil from the Department of State Development and this is Sarah Jane from ATEC. We had a very manual decentralised system after the whole of government image library was shut down. Um, it was very time consuming and difficult to navigate and our ever increasing dependency on digital and visual media meant it would not be sustainable into the future. So the TWIG program was the perfect opportunity to work collaboratively with an SME to take our digital asset management needs to another level. So our definition of done for the project was a secure web-based digital asset management system which is searchable, scalable, intuitive, responsive on mobile device and auditable. Quite a mouthful. It meant that we were looking for a platform with the ability to store, manage and deliver assets at scale via an easy to use web based portal that was accessible on any device. It would improve the management of dis digital assets across the department with the potential to grow an intelligent solution for whole of government across a variety of needs. So 12 weeks ago, ATEC commenced working with us towards realising this vision. We learned a lot along the way, including the benefits around co-location and utilising new technologies to track project planning and making those technologies work for us um, to work together as a team. So today you'll get to see this platform in action and we're very excited to show you how it improves the way we manage our digital assets. And you'll also get to see some of the future possibilities for how technologies such as machine learning can improve the way we operate.
Humans are creating more data every moment that goes by. But data is not just bits and bytes, ones and zeros. As humans, we don't think in numbers. We see and think in pictures. Now, more than ever, we are able to capture images and video footage at any time. We are capturing vast quantities of images and other digital media data. The need to sort and manage these digital assets is a growing problem. The Department of State Development captures a large volume of image and video data each year. But without a dedicated digital asset management tool, finding, managing and using digital assets is not easy. ATEC works with big businesses like airlines, banks and software companies. We deliver Australian cloud hosting, managed services and web development. Our solutions are designed for mission critical requirements, high performance, high security and sophisticated disaster recovery. We've worked with the Twig team to customise Pintura, our digital asset management engine. Together, we've delivered a solution that improves the way Queensland government departments can access, manage and use digital assets using a Queensland-based software-as-a-service model. I think what's changed with Pintura is that we're able to put the kind of power in the user's hands and we can actually really step back and, um, you know, unless there's a restriction around an image, people can download as they will and that really takes, um, yeah, kind of that, you know, that extra work and additional work off our hands. So it's really, to us, it's a, it's a huge time saver. Um, and in terms of some security uh, restrictions as well, so having a, a company that is based in Queensland and has all of those, um, you know, servers and stuff based locally uh, was really important to us as well. I'm really excited to kind of get to the point where we can kind of get stuck in and, and um, roll it out across the business. When you need to find an image for your next project, Pintura makes it easy. Search using tags to quickly find the digital asset you need. Narrow down your search by location, image content, business group or project. Your team has full flexibility to assign metadata and add tags as required. Select and download individual images or download multiple images at a time using the Lightbox feature. Fill out the request form. Now your department has a detailed and auditable record of how the digital asset will be used. OK, you can download your images and get on with your project. Some assets are restricted use only. Before you can download the restricted use asset, your request must be reviewed and approved by a contributor or power user. Our power user receives an email notification prompting them to review your request. Not enough information? Not available for use? No problem. With ATEX Pintura Engine, our power user simply moderates the request. Approve deny or request further information. Pintura is fully responsive, so it's easy to find and use digital assets on desktop, mobile or tablet. Pintura can even tag your assets for you using machine intelligence. Hmm, it doesn't always get it quite right. With training, Pintura's machine intelligence will get more and more accurate over time. That's better. Pintura is built for scale. Even with large volumes of data, ATEC's high-performance cloud platform ensures Pintura is always fast and online. ATEC's military-grade data centres are based in Queensland and are ISO 27001 certified for information security. With a multi-data centre deployment, Pintura can achieve very high levels of availability and disaster recovery for mission-critical requirements. Managing your digital assets is easier than ever before. That's the beauty of Pintura. Hi, I'm Sarah Jane. We'd like to thank Advanced Queensland, the De City Twig team, and the Department of State Development. We are operating in a digital era. Drones, digital cameras, and VR give us the ability to capture images and other data at any point in time. 
but the value of those assets only comes when we can systematise that data. We need the ability to access our digital assets in a meaningful way. We're excited about engaging with government and the potential for a whole of government Pintura solution. It's clear ATEX Pintura engine has the potential to transform digital asset management across a large number of departments. Government field officers now carry a phone. Where do those images get stored? Where are marketing teams storing images? The Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fishing uses drones to fly over farms and manually checks historic data to see if trees have been chopped down. Can we use machine intelligence to detect changes over time and automate this process? Where are you storing your images? If you want to find out more about Pintura, come and visit us at the ATEX store. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cathy Parton from the Department of Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning, and this project was the Planning and Urban Design Simulator. The Testing Within Government program has given our department an opportunity to create an innovative tool that will help us better understand and engage with the community and show our policy and planning in action. Changes to meet the growing population and demand for extra housing choice and affordability is central to shaping SEQ, the new regional plan for South East Queensland. It's easy to ask for opinions on the best way these changes should happen, but people can struggle to picture and understand the changes when they're just words, plans or drawings. The interactive 3D simulation tool that V2i has developed will help genuine engagement with the community about changes to their neighbourhoods. The simulator allows people to easily explore and visualise, compare and rate a range of different scenarios and express what's really important to them and their local communities so that they can provide informed feedback to government about the way we want to live now and might live into the future. Good morning, Peter. Um, look, I understand that our tweak problem is about engaging youth in terms of the planning process, but uh, what's with the family? Uh, vacation care came early, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm sure you're all aware of that. Um, but I'm sure um, Grace and Tom might find what we're doing interesting. But after seeing the QPS uh, presentation, I'm aware of the old saying of uh, kids and animals. But uh, we'll give it a go. All right then. Well, uh, Tom, do you know how to use one of these? Fantastic. And uh, Grace, look, if you play uh, back up, I promise that uh, at the end of the presentation, if you come and visit the V2i stall out in the uh, foyer there, then you can be the first person to put on the Oculus headset and explore what we're about to see in real time. Okay, let's explore. When the program first loads, the user is welcomed with this flash screen. We can choose to play an introductory video. In this case, Malcolm Middleton, the Queensland Government Architect, is shown here outlining the competition objectives. Three modes are then presented, offering us the opportunity to tailor our experience, ranging from a free explore mode with all designs displayed and the opportunity to rate them freely, through two levels of customization to only include designs that reflect our interests. While free explore mode would take us directly to the program, as seen here, and the fully custom mode would require us to fully answer the questions relevant to us. Today, we'll just complete the basic custom mode, which will allow us to filter the designs and only display designs that are focused on one particular question. Where would you enjoy the outdoors? One of the key innovations developed in the Density and Diversity Done Well program is the slider bar that demonstrates the great ideas and housing choice that sits between free standing suburban family homes and the high-rise, high-density living. As you can see, the slider bar is an intuitive method for displaying any number of building designs of varying form and density. The slider bar could potentially be used to compare any form of visual information or scenarios. In this particular instance, we have specifically used a basic grey box style. We could, however, model a richly textured, almost photorealistic environment if required. In each model, you can select layer combinations that include single building design, streetscape, including the roads, verge, footpaths and street trees, open spaces, including public open space such as parks, 
and private open space such as front and backyards and the building design across the whole neighbourhood block. To allow you to fully explore these various designs, you can select three forms of navigation. Aerial mode, where you can spin and navigate around the model in an aerial view. Drone mode, that allows you to freely fly around the model. And ground mode, allowing you to walk freely. You will see here in the top right hand corner some before and after images. Notice how they change as you move the slider bar. When clicked, an iframe is displayed to provide additional information on the scheme. This video is provided by the designer of the scheme, explaining their design ideas. Another video from the design competition judge explains why the scheme was selected as meritworthy. The resources button will also provide instant access to key documents such as the Southeast Queensland Regional Plan and the Q Design Manual. A simple engagement device was developed to rate these designs which deliberately avoids industry terms whilst encouraging you to think about how you live now and into the future. In this instance, the question, where do I enjoy the great outdoors, is the question of interest. You will notice that once we answer yes, this is important to us, we are prompted to rate how the question is answered by the designer of each model using a five star rating system. This rating system will ultimately provide understanding of what the community truly values in the neighbourhood. To provide us with further information on the answers, tags are displayed in the model, providing an example within the scene. These tags, while providing a visual reference within the model as to how the design answers the questions, will also provide additional information on that particular answer. This additional information is accessed by clicking on the information symbol at the top of the tag which will display a light box containing images or a video. Or by approaching the information symbol at the base of the tag, which will display a 3D video billboard and explanatory text. To assist in our understanding of the various designs, there are a number of tools provided. The measurement tools allow us to measure point-to-point -point distance, radius and height. Perhaps as an example, let's measure and see if there's enough space to kick a soccer ball. This point-to-point -point measurement tool can also be useful for measuring shadows, setbacks, or indeed any distance. The shadow analysis tool allows us to adjust the time of year to the summer or winter solstice, and also the time of day. This can be particularly useful to understand how a development can overshadow or indeed how in instances with clever design, areas such as cafes, communal gardens, pools, or play spaces can have their solar access maintained. At any point, we can take a snapshot and then annotate. This process can be repeated, and at any stage, these annotated snapshots can be saved as a PDF, or emailed to friends and families or even the designers themselves, so each design can be refined and updated. Finally, if we have an Oculus Rift, we can launch a virtual tour of each of the schemes. Just before we get this experience though, we're prompted to answer a few simple demographic questions. This won't take us long, but the information it provides is very useful to decision makers in both government and the private sector. And here is our virtual experience. That's it. I think that was an Academy Award winning performance. A round of applause for Grace and Tom. So in summary, I, I'd like to thank the, the Twig team. It was a great experience. I'd like to thank V2I, John and Luke and the team. Well done. Great. It's a great tool. Um, and I'd also like to thank the University of Queensland for providing those models. Can I say that at QUT? I can. Um, <laughs> They did a great job, so we really do appreciate the team effort that went into uh, a great outcome. Thanks very much. Thank you. I think you'll agree we've had some very creative, innovative um, presentations as much as the innovative and creative products we've seen as well, so that's been great. So that's the, um, that's the, the last of our, uh, our panel presenters. So um, now we have the last Q&A session of the... Uh, 
of the morning. I think it's still morning. Um, so any questions from the audience? Roving lights are out there again. Um, so questions of the um, of the SMEs and also any more general questions that you may or may not have in relation to the TWIG program as well. So over to you guys. Hi, a quick question for the Planning and Urban Design Simulation Group. Um, um, in two parts, do you plan to use this to try and gather community feedback on various designs? And if so, how do you track users to make sure that you don't get a particularly motivated anti-group of people coming in 14,000 times, where the people that like it come once um, and, and skew your results that way? So firstly, we recently ran the density and diversity competition. So uh, there was 100 submissions using the same neighbourhood block that you see in that, in that program. So the idea is that possibly we could import all the winning schemes into that model and use it as an engagement tool, um, which is really important because, um, as Cathy mentioned in the intro, um, it's all about people understanding how they might live and how they might live into the future. Um, as simple as playing soccer ball. Look, the issue about moderation is something that we just certainly do need to explore. But I think the star rating, um, the star rating is really important. Um, but you can see the way we could roll that out across the state. A community might actually kind of say, look, I love that tropical terrace idea. The information can feed back to government and they can actually roll out the right building types in the right places to meet the needs of a community. I think as well, in addition to what Peter's just said, uh, one of the things that we've really strived for here is to provide a, a visual language that avoids sort of obfuscation in terms of trying to confuse the community. So rather than being fearful of that feedback, um, I think it's uh, using this, this sort of system, um, we can afford to be a little bit more brave um, because we really aren't trying to confuse with mountains of reports or plans or PDFs. We really are after genuine engagement by really truly trying to demonstrate what's, uh, what's going to hit the ground. Okay, so uh, final questions. We're a little bit over time, so I have to take one final question from the audience. No, if there's no questions then I'd like to introduce our final speaker, a man who needs no introduction, the Director General of uh, the City, uh, Mr Jamie Merrick. Uh, we'd like to Congratulate Colonel Forbes on either side and welcome Jamie Merrick as he enters the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Dallas. And, and look, thanks everyone for coming. Um, Who's learned something today? Or who's been inspired by something today? And I certainly have. Um, who hears from government? Who's seen an application of something from outside of your agency that you could use in your agency? There's a great one for SMEs in the room that you've just sold a lot of product. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to be pretty brief because I'm between you and doing the important bit, which is meeting the, the great companies that are here and, and uh, engaging with them. I guess a number of things from me that really came out of it. One is, isn't government a lightning rod for problems? Um, but that brings huge opportunity with it. Um, look, we're a very big customer, but more importantly, we connect you know, businesses to a whole range of users uh, in very unique ways. Um, and and look, I was really blown away by the, the richness of solutions that were on offer. Um, and they're important from a whole range of, of, of reasons. One is, they're really testament to the creativity, the innovation, the resilience of, of startups and SMEs in Queensland. And um, I say this not as an evangelist for Queensland, but um, it's absolutely true that what you've just seen is a reflection of the fact that this is the most entrepreneurial state in the nation. And you know, all of us in this room, uh, whilst we, we come together and we celebrate these things and we can talk about how we improve programs, it's really important we go out there and we sell the message of how great this place is, the technologies we're developing, the solutions we're developing that are making a difference to businesses and the lives of people across this nation and globally. You know, and you saw it really powerfully here today in terms of the, the, the richness of the solutions on offer. Um, 
you know, this really is about solutions that matter. Um, you know, when you reflect upon, and I'm not going to mention more, but rest space, uh, it's about saving lives of people. Um, you reflect on, on the health examples, making the patient experience better, or an educational platform that potentially reaches hundreds of thousands of children, young people and families. You know, that's stuff that really matters uh, in terms of public services. Um, it's about better public services. We saw products that are about better decision making, governments being smarter, uh, using data better, um, unlocking the value of the data that we hold, around engaging citizens in different ways in the planning process. We've just seen that potentially. Uh, around the power to connect through us engaging with the market in different ways. Um, Truy, um, about new forms of accountability and transparency for government. That's a really powerful thing that you've built there. Um, and, and actually will save us a lot of time as well with all the journal queries we get. Um, so, and I guess in terms of Twig, though, it goes well beyond the individual solutions, um, as powerful as they are in, in, in terms of the reach and impact that they have. Um, I was just noting some of the lessons for both sides here. Um, so in terms of, of government, how we become better to partner with, and, and we heard stories of how it was building skills and capabilities to engage with startups and SMEs. Um, learning around what we need to do to manage our data, the integrity of our data, the accessibility of our data. Um, how we need to change our decision-making processes. Um, the whole issue of privacy and security when you work with government, we're, we're custodians of um, really sensitive information, but we're only custodians, we don't own it. You know, that's, that's Queensland's information we're dealing with. Um, you know, from the business side, you know, the, the, the opportunity you get to, to better understand, albeit sometimes painful, the, the um, needs and, and particular issues that come with dealing with an enterprise scale customer. And, and with government at that, the ability to accelerate your product development process in a relatively safe space that Twig provides, I think is quite a powerful one. That the platform that we provide, whether that's an explicit platform or again, an invisible platform, and that, that's again what struck me around RESPACE, that um, it's not government branded this stuff, but it, it relies on the power of government as a platform to reach potential users. Um, we also heard about new vendor collaborations coming out of this, which is great. Um, an uplifting capability in, in doing so. And, and I guess the, the, the shared areas of learning around how do we actually make Agile work? Um, I know I certainly speak to the team both in the city and more broadly around, we're, we're at a, a strange, or not strange actually, you know, we're, we're at an inflection point about the processes of government and how fit for purpose they are in terms of the development cycle now that we see of technology. And, and I say that whether that's about procurement or about parliament making legislation, that the pace of change of technology means we've got to speed up government dramatically. And, and Twig's a microcosm of how we make that happen, and a very important one at that. Um, and I guess the other important dimension is, I, I heard a, a few times about, again, both from a government perspective and from a, an SME or startup perspective about you know, new understandings of, of potential customer experiences that you wouldn't necessarily have had had you not gone through this process, which again is a very powerful thing for, for both government in the way we redesign public services, but for startups and SMEs trying to reach new customers. Um, I think and I hope um, this process has really demonstrated the willingness of government to change, to open up, to partner with new people. And I'll just use the example of, of, of the department that I belong to. Um, so in 2015-16, we doubled the number of contracts we had with startups and SMEs. Last year, we more than doubled that again. And, and that brings a whole sense of new creativity and, and innovation to the work that we do. And it wouldn't come from doing things the traditional way we do them. And, and you know, that, that issue I talked about, about the need to speed government up, it wouldn't happen unless we get uh, new ideas at, at the table in terms of um, thinking through and really fundamentally changing the very way we do business. Um, Look, I, I certainly found it very, very inspiring. Um, there's a few metaphors I could talk to. One is that we had, uh, A, how much Andrew Spiner likes being on video. Um, I'm gonna have to speak to him about that one. Um, but I was gonna use the archives metaphor. We saw two archives projects, and, and Queensland State Archives is just the most amazing untapped resource in this state. And there are stories in that place that are inspiring, that are actually challenging, and, and um, I'm trying to see where you are. 
Um, you, you, you very much spoke to, to, to some of those, but also challenged the whole issue of identity and some of the troubled past of, of, of Queensland as well. But it's such a rich resource, and you saw two projects that are really opening up access to, to that incredible uh, history that, that is there. And, um, and, and I won't get the numbers right, but um, trust me, they're in the ballpark. Um, so, so two years ago, the, the number of records that were accessed was broadly around 30 to 40,000. Um, it was last year around 2 million um, because we're putting more and more in digital format online for people to access wherever they are in the state or globally. Um, that's a very powerful thing to open up government and to open up that actually, again, us just being custodians of Queensland's history. Um, and I thought about the archives as a metaphor for um, the hidden histories or the hidden talents of Queensland SMEs. So again, it comes back to this issue of it's just a huge opportunity to showcase what you do because you can lead the way in this space and you are doing. Um, look, I'm probably going to finish there. Um, just to say, uh, um, Twig itself is, is an emergent program. It was, someone mentioned the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, and, and there was a bit of that going into this. Um, you know, it is fundamentally about changing the way government does business, and it's about building confidence for people to do things differently. It's about um, thinking through risk in different ways. Uh, it's about challenging the authorising environment. I heard someone talk about that, that it wouldn't have happened otherwise without this sort of process. Um, it's around, you know, as I say, um, reducing the, the product development test production cycle so we get um, product out there earlier to, to Queenslanders. So, look, thank you all for participating. Thank you to, to Marek. Uh, is, is he still in the room? Um, certainly every time I hear him, I learn something new. Um, can I thank um, Tom and Peter again, who have been um, incredible mentors throughout the process and, and really are you know, the, 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 the two people who, who prevent the lost in translation uh, sometimes from happening. Um, the amazing businesses who participated. Uh, look, last year I scared the pants off my team when uh, we did four last year, and I said, oh, wouldn't it be great if we had 20 agencies doing four products next time around? Now, we didn't quite achieve that, but what we did have was eight agencies participating. Um, so things are really starting to move, and can I really thank those agencies for their participation? Um, it's hugely appreciated. Um, I'll certainly reflect back to, to um, my colleagues uh, the, the power of... Um, the work that's been done through this program, and it's down as much to you as the, you know, really intelligent customers that, that we need to have in government. Um, and can I thank the Twig team within the city? It's um, it really is the sort of work that you do and the commitment you have to it is what makes it such a privilege and so humbling to to work for the organisation. So thank you. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, now go and buy products off these great SMEs. Uh, thanks, Jamie, for those insightful words. I just want to just quickly wrap up. Um, just again, a, uh, a big thank you to uh, Tom and Peter for their participation. A big thank you for the SMEs and agencies. And agencies, I think, have been very brave in bringing forward some of their problems and, and being involved in this process. Um, and uh, um, as Jamie's quick uh, straw survey did, um, it would appear that there's probably a few other government problems out there that uh, there may be some solutions to be looked at at the booth. So I encourage you to attend the booth at the end of the session. And just, uh, and just uh, also um, a big thank you to my Twig team. So there's a lot of effort goes into running the program. There's a lot of effort goes into running an event like this. Um, Apologise we're slightly over time, but um, I might ask and embarrass my team to ask them to stand up. So Donna, Maria, Nicole steps up the back, I think somewhere in the, in the booth. But Emma and Shane uh, and Mark is uh, swanning in the Greek island somewhere. So thank you for the team. And uh, Donna, did I, did I forget anyone? Didn't forget anyone, did I? Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll thank them later. I'm getting in trouble. And finally, I guess uh, a big thank you for yourselves for taking so much time out of your busy diaries to come along and attend this event. I think you would agree that there's been some very exciting uh, presentations, very creative presentations, uh, and some very exciting and interesting um, products that have come out of this process. So thank you all and encourage you to uh, go outside and visit the booths. Thank you.